We have a quorum of members present this morning and the New York City Board of Corrections, September 13th, 2022 meeting is now in session. Everybody hear me? Is that better? Is that working? Awesome. Okay. So our first order of business today is a vote on the draft minutes for the July 12, 2022 board meeting, which the board members have received. Uh, when the board member moves for a vote to approve the July 12, 2022 meeting minutes. So moved. Second. Approved the second. Board member have any edits or comments on the minutes? Um, and I'll call for a vote to approve the July 12, 2022 minutes. So um, I'm going to do the Board of Correction updates first. And then, Denise, do we have someone um, who has comments right after we? Uh... So on today's agenda, we have our updates, a report from Commissioner Molina on the Rikers Task Force progress, the issue of staff absenteeism and, and disciplinary numbers, and progress on the ESH reset that was discussed at our last meeting. We also have correctional health services updates, the BOC's death report for the deaths in custody that occurred in 2021 was released yesterday. We have updates from the committee. We're covering the EMTC central intake operations, violence indicators, the use of the de-escalation units, and we will have a public comment period which will include calls to our dedicated phone line for people who are currently in custody. For the board updates, as you know, we have three new deaths in custody since our last meeting to report, bringing the total to 13 deaths in custody so far this year in our jails. And before, before we speak about this subject, um, we did want to note that if you are struggling with suicidal thoughts or experiencing a mental health crisis and you live in New York City, you can call 188-NYC-WELL for free and confidential crisis counseling. And if you live outside the five boroughs, you can dial the 24-hour-day 24, 24 National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-8255. Or go to suicidepreventionlifeline.org. The latest deaths in custody are Michael Lopez, who died on July 15th, leaving behind his mother. His death was a suspected overdose at this point. Also, Ricardo Cruciani, who died on July 22nd of suicide by hanging. And Michael Nieves, who died on August 25th, Mr. Nieves was housed in the PACE unit, the program to accelerate clinical effectiveness. And he had an extensive history of mental illness and self-harm. He used a razor to cut his own throat and was found bleeding in his cell by an officer who did not perform first aid. At first, he was able to converse with the officer, but he gradually collapsed over the course of 10 minutes before medical assistance arrived to attempt first aid. He was hospitalized and declared brain dead and then deceased. Our staff is actively investigating deaths, all of the deaths in uh, this year, and we will be convening CHS and DOC together to discuss these deaths and how to avoid them in the future, and we will be issuing another report. The board also expresses condolences for several deaths of department staff since our last meeting. They include retired officer Pamela Martin, retired officer Jimmy Duran, retired officer Joseph Conclaves, officer Darchel King, retired ADW Migdalia Montagna, Mary Beal, the mother of CO Ryan Gunning, Doreen Angela Barrett Medford, a social worker formerly assigned to the care unit. 
Retired Captain George Torres, retired Captain Samuel Brown, retired Captain Herbert Moultrie, retired Officer Earl Gaskins, retired Officer my minute. I'm an apologies. I'm not going to get this right, but I'll call it. I'll let's see. Officer Donovan Reese, Wanda Sutton, who is the mother of CO Tanisha Sutton Spell, Sadia Issa, the wife of Chaplain Issa Yaya, retired Imam Imar Abul Jamil, retired Specialist Kathy Garcia, retired Officer George Mason. Retired Officer Patricia Ann Baki. We also thank COBA Representative Ashafi Antoine for her participation in the board's public comment periods and her consistent engagement with our staff. Since the beginning of this administration, a number of EEOs have been renewed every five days. That's emergency executive orders. Renewed every five days based on the emergency crisis regarding the staffing in our jails. These EEOs suspend various of our minimum standards. The minimum standards that we established by regulation as the bare minimum that the city finds acceptable for humane treatment of people in custody. The emergency executive orders which are still in place today include EEO 241, which was initially issued a year ago on September 15, 2021. It declared a state of emergency within the correction facilities operated by DOC due to excessive staff absenteeism and staff shortages. It suspended BOC minimum standards relating to the commingling of inmate populations to permit DOC to merely consider safe housing alternatives for the young adults, and it suspended minimum standards relating to enhanced supervision housing to allow the commingling of young adults and adults in that housing. EEO 279 was issued on uh, was issued on November 1st of 2021. It suspended our minimum standards regarding involuntary lock-in, in, in other words, time in and out of cell. It also suspended our standards allowing access to the law library. Many other of our basic standards were suspended relating to um, implementation of restrictive housing, including aspects of the new RMAS system. EEO 279 was issued November 23rd, 21 as a corrective um, to make clear that although RMAS would be delayed, that the ESH rules were reinstated. And those are the rules that existed before RMAS and were to be replaced with RMAS. And that needed to be cleaned up because um, it was unclear in the initial EEO. EEO 66 issued in March of this year um, moved a special housing area where many of our minimum standards had been suspended um, from GRBC to NIC and allowed for the people in custody in that particular area to be locked out. In order to understand how the lack of staff attendance is being addressed and when this emergency might come to an end, we have asked for granular disaggregated data regarding officer attendance ever since February of the beginning of this year. Um, the department has only provided us with top level aggregate data. So we reiterate that request again at this meeting as we have since February. In other announcements, uh, since we last met, the first report of the task force on issues faced by TGN CNBI people in custody was released on August 15th. The report um, was authored by Ash McGovern, Deborah, I'm going to pronounce her name wrong and I'm apologizing in advance for that. Um, Lole, Dory Lewis, Kendra Park, Clark, Mick Kincaid, and Shira Avery. 
And the group was convened by our staff member, Heather Burgess, uh, who worked tirelessly for quite a long time to facilitate the creation and the release of that report. And as was mentioned earlier, yesterday we released our report on the deaths in custody during 2021, focusing on the suicides and the overdoses and the patterns in those deaths. Yesterday, we also welcomed Daniel Luis Ortega to the board um, on her first day of work yesterday. I'm very pleased that Danielle has joined us, and some of you may remember her as the OMB Correction Unit Head from 2012 to 2014. Danielle has a passion for criminal justice reform and for fairness in the workplace. She started her career as an AmeriCorps member and carries the values of service to community with her everywhere. She has incorporated DNI training in her work and has worked to ensure fairness among the many teams and many offices that she has managed over her years in the city of New York. Danielle has 13 years of experience managing government budgets, including service as the unit head for OMB's correction unit, where she oversaw a $2.3 billion portfolio. As deputy director of budget and grants for the Kings County District Attorney's Office, where she managed a $95.5 million budget as Associate Director at the Mayor's Office of Contract Services, where she increased the budget by $17 million, managed an office consolidation, and created and staffed a new finance unit. And as Director of the Expense Budget for the New York City Department of Transportation, where she managed a billion dollar budget. Welcome, Danielle. And also today, some BOC staff are attending the 28th Annual National Association for Civilian Oversight of Law Enforcement, otherwise known as the NACOL Conference. Um, one of our staffers is a board member of that national organization and is attending wearing that hat. And the other staffer is presenting a seminar uh, entitled Violence in Jails and Prisons, Strategies for Oversight and Prevention. Also, our, our Deputy General Counsel, Melissa Cintron Hernandez, will be teaching a continuing legal education course for the New York City Bar this fall as a member of the Government Ethics and State Affairs Committee of the Bar. The course covers the Freedom of Information Law, also known as FOIL, an area in which she has a great deal of expertise. Some basic census data. Uh, as of September 1st, AMKC has 2,056 people. Bellevue Hospital Prison Ward has 41 people. Elmhurst Prison Ward has no people and no beds. EMTC has 704 people. GRBC has 726 people. North Infirmary Command has 259. Rosie's has 347. RNDC has 803. VCBC, the boat, has 711. West Facility has 71 uh, for a total of 5,718. Turning it over to Julia. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the board has asked the Commissioner Molina to prepare a presentation updating us on the following. The Rights Task Force of its progress. Staff absenteeism and discipline numbers. Mm -hmm. Progress on ESH Misa described at our July meeting. Uh, Commissioner Molina is not present. And I believe first deputy commissioner. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the controller does need to interrupt because his schedule um, doesn't. This is the only time that he, he can speak. So we're going to have a, a brief moment where we allow his public comment and then we'll move on. I'm, I'm afraid we're going to have to. We're going to have to switch to the video for for a few minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. I really appreciate your accommodating me. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, thank you to the chair and the members and staff of the Board of Correction for providing the opportunity to testify to you today for your flexibility and especially, of course, for your ongoing work to demand accountability of the New York City Department of Correction. Tars Youngblood, George Pagan, Herman Diaz, Deshaun Carter, Mary Yehuda, Manuel Sullivan, Antonio Bradley, 
Annabelle Carrasquillo, Albert Dry, Elijah Muhammad, and as the chair read earlier already, Michael Lopez, Ricardo Fruciani, and Michael Nieves, just since your last meeting. 13 lives lost in our city jails in just eight months this year. That makes 29 people since the beginning of 2021. And as the strong report that this board released yesterday revealed, and at least 10 of the 16 deaths last year, there was some type of correction officer lapse or failure. As I appear before you today to share my perspective on the ongoing crisis in our jails, two weeks after visiting several of the facilities on Rikers myself, I fear that we are becoming accustomed to such loss, this ultimate form of violence. The status quo is wholly unacceptable. And yet the number of people in Department of Correction custody is rising. Yesterday, there were nearly 5,900 people in DOC custody, up 9% from the beginning of January. Length of stay in custody is similarly increasing. During the month of August, people discharged from city jails spent an average of 114 days in custody compared to 105 days just in July. And unlike the early days of the pandemic, the city does not appear to be taking meaningful steps to decarcerate. Year-to-date arrests are up 26%, and the citizens' population, which had been reduced to around 100 during the pandemic and had largely stayed there, has now climbed to over 400, up 186% from the start of this year. In my brief testimony today, I'd like to focus on two topics in particular. First, the need for and my own commitment to greater transparency around DOC operations, particularly as the city works to implement its action plan. And second, the urgency of ending all forms of solitary confinement. Uh, when I became city controller, I pledged to do my part to hold the Department of Correction accountable for reducing violence and meeting minimum standards and to bring some measure along with the good work you're doing of public transparency to what have historically been opaque operations. Uh, after making uh, uh, information requests to the department in January and analyzing data that they made available to us, for which we are grateful in the subsequent months, my office released a DOC dashboard that I'm going to try to share with you if I can. Let's see. Oh, yeah, there we go. Um, so we put this dashboard up last month. One uh, nice thing about it is all the data can be downloaded, so you can both see uh, what is improving, what is worsening, what hasn't seen any change in areas of staffing and jail population, in terms of paid absences, which the chair was talking about, in terms of violence, including stashings and slabbings, which are dramatically up in recent months, in terms of of service provision. Um, we'll be uh, publishing our first major monthly update later today. Uh, a couple of things about that. That will show that the share of officers out sick, uh, as the chair said, a major factor in the ongoing staffing management crisis, which had seen reductions earlier this year, flattened out over the summer. In August, an average of 12% of uniformed officers were out sick each day, about the same as July and double the share of officers out sick in August 2018 prior to the pandemic. With this month's release, we'll also be adding a new chart to track the number and share of people in custody with serious mental illness, uh, including schizophrenia, depression, and PTSD. According to the latest Local Law 59 reports from Correctional Health Services, more than 1,000 people, so nearly one in five people in our city jails, has been diagnosed with serious mental illness. We know they have little chance of getting adequate treatment in jail. We know the jail conditions are likely to make their illnesses worse. We know how quickly people can decompensate while in custody. The report the board released yesterday on those 10 of the 16 deaths in 2021 shows plainly the horrifying consequences of mental health conditions going untreated, combined with the department's inability to render appropriate aid. Yet despite knowing all that, we continue to allow it to be the case that Rikers is the largest de facto mental health facility in our city. We'll continue to monitor and update these data, all of which, as I said, can be downloaded from our website in the coming months. 
Uh, it's my hope that this information will be useful to the public and to criminal legal system partners as well. Let's try to stop the share now. Um, the second on ending solitary confinement. On August 29th, uh, I visited Rikers Island along with public advocate Jumani Williams and council member and chair of the Criminal Justice Committee, Carlina Rivera, spending several hours touring four facilities, GRBC, EMTC, RMFC, and the NIC. Given the delays in implementation of RMAS, one of my goals was to talk to some of the individuals detained in and staffing restrictive housing. Uh, I do want to report the people I spoke to in GRBC did report that they were receiving seven to 10 hours of out of cell time and the conditions we observed were meaningfully better than the restricted housing units that I have seen on prior visits. However, we also saw firsthand that other forms of segregation being deployed by the department are functioning as solitary confinement. While touring NIC, I observed seven individuals in involuntary protective custody who were being held in dark, small, double vestibule cells, not much larger than their beds, for 22 or 23 hours a day, with no access to meaningful engagement with other people or to congregate programming, without any deadline, several of them well beyond 15 consecutive days, even for weeks on end. And DOCs claim that going from one of the two dark, tiny vestibules to the other, neither large enough to fit the desk I'm sitting at, counts as out of cell time, is frankly gaslighting. It is not compliant with the law. Uh, we also know that Elijah Muhammad died in July after being locked in one of the department's so-called de-escalation units. This cannot continue. I am encouraged that the council, city council, will soon be considering legislation to more strongly prohibit solitary confinement by DOC. And I'm eager to make sure that it would clearly and firmly prohibit, it, prohibit the form of solitary confinement that I saw recently at NIC. During that visit, I also asked how DOC had improved their suicide watch protocols given the recent suicides. And I was assured by the DOC staff that I spoke with that they had taken steps to improve and had things under control but infuriatingly, we were not told that just days earlier, as we were there, Michael Nieves, just before we were there, Michael Nieves had attempted suicide with correction officers watching and failing to intervene. He was on life support as we were touring, died the following day. Now, I know there are staff on Rikers Island today who are working in good faith to improve conditions. We met and talked with some of them on our visit. But the reality we must face is that deaths and violence have not abated. While I recognize that the jail population is the result of decision-making on the part of many different criminal legal system actors, the Board of Correction has a critical voice. So with the data before you now on deaths, on persistent staff absenteeism, and on rates of violence, I urge you first to support and call publicly for immediate reductions in the jail population, Second, to ensure that no person who is placed in the custody of DOC any length of time is ever held again in solitary confinement. And finally, to establish firm expectations for improvements in the rates of violence and death with consequences up to and including the board's support for receivership if those targets are not met in a time. Thank you very much for this opportunity to testify again for your flexibility of accommodating me at this time and especially for the ongoing work that you do to bring transparency and accountability. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. well, you to just... Yes, I just, uh, I'd like to uh, take a moment to uh, ask for a minute of silence uh, for those that we lost at the World Trade Center. As you know, this last Sunday was the 21st anniversary of the destruction of the World Trade Center. And to date, we have 28 uniform members of staff from the Department of Correction who have perished, who served over at the World Trade Center. Uh, I never forget that day. Uh, it was primary day in the city of New York. 
and many of the people that were serving at the primary were also part of law enforcement who were volunteering throughout the city, but they ran to assist quickly down at the World Trade Center, and particularly Imam Umar, who passed away this last week, a week ago, two weeks ago, who was the assistant commissioner ahead, the head of ministerial services in your department. And he served all through that, those, that year at the morgue identifying bodies, representing the New York City Department of Correction. I must say that the Department of Correction and members of the board were never recognized for the service that they rendered during those 21 years. And I was glad to see that this last uh, September 9th, uh, the Department of Correction had a memorial service uh, dedicated to those that we lost at the World Trade Center. So ladies and gentlemen, I would appreciate if we can together bow our heads for a minute of silence. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to start this again. <laughs> Before we move into the rest of the meeting, I would like to acknowledge the losses that we've experienced at our last meeting. Sadly, we have lost a few active duty staff members since we last met. I would like to express my heartfelt condolences to the families and friends of our boldest family who we lost too soon. CEO Darkel King, Captain Lafatiki Coldwell, CEO Donovan Reese, CEO Carl Viello, Motor Vehicle Operator Larry Newell, and Program Specialist Kathy Garcia. I would also like to offer my sincere condolences to the families and loved ones of Mr. Lopez, Mr. Cruciani, and Mr. Nieves. I would like to take this opportunity to provide the board with an update on the department's progress since our last meeting and address items related to the action plan, staff absenteeism and accountability, and the progress on the ESH reset. The action plan is a roadmap to address foundational issues within the department that have developed over years of mismanagement and ultimately create a safer, more stable environment within the jails. We've made significant progress thus far in implementing this plan and we'll continue to work with the interagency task force to problem solve any barriers and collaboratively move all action items forward. In the past few months, we've hired several key executive staff, as required by the action plan, who come to us with years of experience and expertise in correctional best practices. Mr. Ronald Brereton was hired in mid-May for the role of DC of Security Operations. Mr. Christopher Miller was hired in late July to the role of DC of Classification, Custody Management, and Facility Operations. Most recently, we hired Mr. Ronald Edwards as DC of Administration and Uniform Staff Scheduling. These leaders will be, a critical, will be critical in supporting the implementation of the action plan and the creation of safer, more humane jails for staff and people in custody. We've also onboarded an associate commissioner of data quality and metrics and other high level positions within our office of data quality and metrics, um, within our office of management analysis and planning as part of our commitment to ensuring that operational and policy decisions are data driven. With the support of this new team, the department recently launched a public data dashboard tracking several key metrics relating to staffing, population demographics, and violence indicators. The dashboard will be updated regularly as part of our ongoing commitment 
to increasing transparency and public trust. Further, as required by the action plan, we're working to make the facilities safer for people living and working inside them by repairing failing and outdated, outdated facility infrastructure. We have affixed window coverings on 225 windows in RNDC, which restricts access to plexiglass that can be used to make weapons that can cause serious injury to staff and people in custody. We've also been able to install 500 out of 550 new cell doors with state-of-the-art locking mechanisms at RNDC. On restrictive housing, the department is working with Dr. James Austin, a renowned corrections expert, to design a restrictive housing system that adheres to correctional best practices and is ultimately approved by the federal monitor. This plan will be shared with the board after it has been finalized and shared with the parties. In the interim, we continue to operate ESH housing with operational changes meant to bring the ESH program closer to the spirit of the risk management accountability system, while maintaining safety for staff and people in custody. Since the appointment of the new Deputy Warning Command of ESH, we have seen significant improvement in the operations and overall atmosphere in our restrictive housing units. Individuals in ESH are regularly locking out and engaging in programming with minimal incidents. Individuals in ESH are reviewed on a weekly basis by the programs division for progression into the next level or out of ESH and into a general population unit. And that paperwork is being shared with the board. Finally, we've made significant strides with regards to staff absenteeism and accountability. Staff accountability is imperative in any profession but especially in professions that hold significant public trust. It is critical that we give our staff the tools they need to perform their jobs and equally critical that we take action when our staff do not perform their jobs up to our standards. Commissioner Molina has been laser focused on staff accountability since his first day in office. Since January, he has term terminated approximately 160 67 staff members who have complied with department policy, complied with department policy which is 500 staff has, have been suspended, which also far surpasses the department's number of suspensions issued in prior two calendar years combined. This department expects professional excellence. Accordingly, all DOC staff, including our leadership team, will be fairly judged against those standards and be held accountable for any failures. However, let me be clear, our staff will be the game changers that will help turn around this agency. As we hold our staff accountable, it is equally important that we continue to support them. Our staff have one of the toughest jobs in law enforcement, and there is no doubt that they are commi all committed to improving this agency. As we have stated previously, these issues are complex, and it will take bold and dedicated work to implement sustainable change. But we are committed to this task and we are making progress. We will continue to keep the board informed of our progress with the action plan and other improvements in future meetings and regularly update the public dashboard for public awareness. My team and I are available to answer your questions today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, questions? Excuse me, Commissioner, have you developed a, a table of organization for your staff as yet? We do have a TO. Um, I believe that is being shared with the board on a regular basis. Most recent. Yes. Our TO is 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 done on a weekly basis. On a weekly basis. Correct. And you have the civilian as and also the uniform. Yes. That is that information is being shared with the board members. I can have that sent to you following this meeting. I, I would appreciate that. Sure. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioner. Um, many of our um, many of the terrible incidents that have occurred in the past six months, and uh, including some of the deaths, by our analysis, are been based on lack of staff in the housing areas, not having a B officer present. 
we still think that we still find that frequently. Could you tell us how many units, housing units are not staffed 24 hours a day by B officers? We've asked you this question before. You've been reluctant to, to answer, but I hope today is different. So I don't have that information readily available, but I believe we're sharing information with you with respect to our on staff post. No, you're not. So, so the information, my understanding is that the information is being shared on a weekly basis. Happy to talk to you following this meeting, but our executive director just indicated to me that, that this information is being shared. Well, can you, do you, do you have information regarding how many posts are not being staffed in each facility each week? So our, the information that's sent to your office, I have a running numbers of the unstaffed posts throughout the facilities. Um, so on September 3rd, it was a total of 27 unstaffed posts. That's covering 24 hours a day? That's correct. Um, I'm happy to forward this okay. to you following our meeting, but this information is being shared with well, I, I apologize. on a this weekly week. basis. I, I last known that we had not uh, asked sure. for that. I understand. Um, what, what is the plan for um, staffing those 27 posts? So we are heavily recruiting. Um, as you know, we've been working very hard to help management division, ensuring that people are getting um, the adequate care that they need um, and getting back to work. So we've, uh, from the beginning of the, from the beginning of June, we had approximately a thousand staff members out. That number is now decreased significantly to 800 and we're continuing to make progress to get people back to work and in addition to recruiting. We just onboarded a class um, of approximately 115 recruits and they're scheduled to graduate at the end of the year. And recruitment is ongoing. Have you improved the staffing of units? Yes. Can you give a quantitative aspect to that? Again, I can provide you with the numbers that that are provided to you on a weekly basis. Well, I appreciate that. And, and I just wanted the question though, why was a Commissioner Molina unable to come today? Commissioner Molina had another engagement and I am here in his stead. Thank you. Thank you. And any other questions? Um, yeah, hi, good morning. I have a couple of follow-up questions on that. Um, for the staffing, for the unstaffed posts, would it be also possible to get that by facility? Because, um, you know, as we all know, it's a large department and absences can impact different departments in different ways. So if it's not already broken up, um, uh, could it be? And then additionally, um, you know, information as well about officers who are working more than a single shift and certainly more than a double shift um, would be relevant if we could get that kind of at the same time. Um, and so specifically not a completed triple, right? Not not three shifts, but anyone who goes into that third shift um, to get that by facility, I think would really help to complete the picture. Okay, thank you. That that would be incredibly helpful. Um, and just going back to what you had mentioned about the classes, um, it's great that a new class um, will be finishing at the end of the year. Do you have dates and class sizes projected into the future? And what is the recruitment process looking like um, just in terms of number of people who are ready to enter those classes, who have completed the screening process? Um, is that data available? So our, uh, I can get that information to you. I know that our HR team is working on compiling what the projected classes and sizes would look like. So we can provide that information to you offline. Okay, thank you. Jackie. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioner. Um, 
During our last meeting, we spent a bit of time um, speaking with the commissioner about progress that had been made and was being made at reducing violence at RNDC. Um, and I would like to hear a bit more about um, that work, how that work has proceeded over the summer. I'd also specifically like to um, hear uh, your uh, observations around the use of emergency lock-ins, um, which as we uh, reviewed statistics over the summer, we noted that there was a substantial increase um, particularly in July, in the use of emergency lock-ins at RNDC. Um, so I'd like to sort of hear how you're tracking that, um, your observations on that, and um, how the uh, department is addressing that on an ongoing basis, um, and also moving forward with the initiatives that the commissioner discussed with us uh, in July. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, as you're aware, uh, in the beginning of March, we implemented a violence reduction plan in RNDC. What we saw was there a significant decrease in stabbings and slashings throughout that facility. The facility was merged with um, additional support with staffing, and we saw a significant decrease in the numbers of in the violence in that facility. Um, what we've since begun doing is expanding that violence reduction plan to other facilities, which include GRBC. Um, in terms of the lockdowns, I just want to note lockdowns, we've been, in addition to for the violence reduction plan, we've been doing a lot of tactical search operations. And so lockdowns are typically um, in response to tactical search operations in, in the event that we need to search, we need to do investigations into use of forces, Lockdowns are utilized on those bases, um, but the department is committed to ensuring that we curb the violence within the jails. And so you mentioned the lockdowns increasing. We're using, we're utilizing the lockdowns. It's not as a, a, a disciplinary measure. It's to ensure that the safe, safety and security and good order facility. Quick follow-up question to that as well. Um, the response time when, when violence happens, and we've had a session where we talk about violence, but at least we saw a video that it took these men inside, stabbed each other, beat each other for eight minutes, 10 minutes um, before anyone responded. Is that the norm in response time? So I'm not familiar with the incident that you're referring to. Happy to talk about that particular incident if you can provide details sure. um, regarding that incident. You see, there was about 15 people, 10 people, seven, and the other five people. Um, they were at the bubble, hit the door, bubble didn't open, um, and the response time, get yeah. About eight minutes it took me. Four, 14, 14 minutes. 14 minutes. Well, 14 minutes. 14 minutes. I'm sorry. 14 minutes. Um, and I, I, can give, I can be more specific, and I, I have some of the minutes here to read actually what happened. I think you can be more specific about this incident. Uh, 4407 slash 22. So, in, in response. Um, with respect to the question on the typical response time, we can look into that and provide you with the actual data. Um, I believe I know the incident that you're referring to. Uh, the officers uh, were dispatched and they got there to the incident as quickly as they could. 14 minutes. I'm just, again, I'm just, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out the other side of the prison. Were they, were they responding to something yeah. else at the time? When, I mean, there are numerous one. incidents mm -hmm. that are happening throughout the facility on any given day. And so in that particular incident, happy to talk to you more about it um, and provide uh, specific details on that incident. Um, but the officers responded to the incident as quickly as they could. Okay. Just one, one follow-up on that. Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, 
you had previously at some point you would the department had had a system of having officers who were in the facility, not in ESU, whatever you're calling it this week, um, come when there was a when there was an incident. Now it appears that the ESU was the ESU responded to this. Do you have a is there anything other than ESU when you have a an alarm? Good morning, Dr. Collins. Good morning, Chief Um to respond to the question, um, um, we developed a strategic response team to assist. Yeah. You, you know, because That's our team. The yeah. fact that um, you know, the ESU was overwhelmed, you know, um, supporting the entire department. So what we developed was SRT units. We, we have one initially, developed one at RDC that was very successful. It, it worked. So now we just um, set up a unit at GRMC. And, um, Go back to this gentleman's question. I believe the incident you talked about, I think it occurred at like five, like about five in the morning. And that was basically the issue at hand. You know, it took a little longer. Usually it might be like three minutes, something like that, but it was definitely a little overextended due to the fact it happened so early in the morning during the, I think, the new day. So nobody was around at that time. I'm just, I just don't have a. I'm just trying to be kind of a baseball. So staff, staff were around, staff is still coming, coming on board. You know, so now they assume they're coming in, they can just them down to the unit. Right. It was, it was 14 minutes. I just, right. Again, I only say it's 14 minutes. And she watching the blood on the walls of the people that were being stabbed, banging on the bubble. It was just difficult to watch. And, and, and again, I, I bring it up to say maybe there's ways that we can, if, if that happened, we can. Rectify it and figure out so something like that doesn't happen again. When I saw five men laying in their own blood, um, it was kind of difficult. And, and the last man who was actually was standing was banging on the bubble, and no one opened for him. Um, it's just difficult to see that and that level of violence um, taking place for that long of a period. And, and just to note, um, as a factual matter, at 521, as the fight was continuing. Uh, the B post officer exited the housing area to enter the A station, and then for the next 12 minutes, there were no DOC staff present. But there, there was a staff present in the beginning when they left. The um, I have a follow-up question. Policy, but but you know, I thought we we stayed there and we de-escalated that to see a officer leave that area. And allow you know, some of the folks just continue to stand each other. It was horrific to watch. And, and again, I, I'm, I'm sure that the process is in place in the future to, to prevent something like that. Right. Um, that's point taking. Um, but, that, but it was also on post. Right. Now, if, 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 if you look at the video, the officer almost got hit, struck with, with a fan, I believe, it threw an object, almost hit the officer. So the officer was the only one at that point, the officer went inside. Forward further assistance because it's like, like you said, the number of I think between 14 and 15. Um, right, that's one officer. So the ratio was, you know, definitely overwhelming. So he was, and, and, and I get that. I, I just think my point was it took so long. Right, no, I, I get that. I get that. Right, right. But like, but like I said earlier, um, he's definitely, um, Working, like I said, um, to have them, you know, like self sufficient with their own unit that consists of them. But just at that time of the day, that morning, more or less, was, um, you know, it, it was um, just less sad, you know, and it just took some time to build a team to go down there to quell that violence. And, and, and from the video, you can see that it was orchestrated, everything was orchestrated in terms of the time that they were going to get them back to violence. And so the officer tried as much as he could and then signaled for us to um, the other teams. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Felipe, you had your hand up. I'm sorry. And then I'll just you. No, okay. no, thank you. Um, I hope you can listen to me well. I, I want to follow up on board Sherman's questions regarding lockdowns. Um, first, I mean, it's hard to understand, and maybe the department can help us understand. Why would you need to have 238 lockdowns in the month of July? Um, you know, 30 days, 238 lockdowns. Um, it's almost like having everyone under isolation and room confinement. 
but could you explain why 238 times? So, so just as a uh, board member of Chair Medina just indicated that incident uh, that occurred that we were just discussing, it really just demonstrates the type of individuals in custody and the violence that we are dealing with. And in order to conduct investigations in order to keep people safe, you know, we are conducting tactical search operations on a daily basis. We are looking into these cases. And in order to keep people safe and the good order of the facility, we are, if, if, it's, if it's for a temporary moment, locking the facility down to, to conduct an investigation. I mean, lock, lockdowns are not temporary. I mean, um, I spent a significant amount of time looking at the videos. I also spent time on Friday talking to young adults at RNDC. Again, we're talking about 238 times within a 30-day period. Many of these young people don't, are not going out. I mean, I talk to them. I mean, many of them during lockdown, they're not able to take showers. So, I mean, it's not unusual for them to spend two or three days without a shower. Uh, many of them can talk to their family. Again, fully isolated. Um, many of them don't have any access to the commissary. Again, 238 times out of 30 days. They have no access to the legal library. And for all purposes, they're actually isolated uh, as a whole group in confinement. So again, lock-ins can occur following a violent incident. That incident necess necessitates that the area be secured in order to ensure safety or de de decontaminate the area. They can also occur for operational reasons, such as to secure an area for the purposes of conducting an investigation into a use of force incident or other purposes of conducting a research. So again, we're dealing with a much violent population. And one of the things is that it's a critical tool to ensure the safety of, of, of the department. Uh, you you open up talking about how RNDC violence was actually going down. I'm sorry. I mean, I, I think I heard you say in the opening statement that the violence at RNDC was actually going down, even though you had to respond by 238 lockdowns just in the month of July. Good morning. Anybody, all, all lockdowns aren't just for um, acts of violence. Sometimes we lock down an area because there might be some aggressive activity. Like, for example, someone might be smoking, so we don't know if the individual smoking K2, fat, or whatever. So we will lock down an area to conduct a, a search. You know, so therefore, it's not, it's not just for uh, locking down any type of violent act. So it can be similar to other things. They take the trouble to ensure um, that and the uh, I mean, I think what I want to get across, lockdowns are hurtful, and these young people and the inmates are actually, are, uh, are you know, withdrawn from, from contact, they're completely isolated, they can actually take showers, food actually is not consistent, they don't get access to the pantry, they don't get access to, to the legal library. I mean, every time that you do one of these 238 lockdowns, it has actually a negative impact in those that you serve. So, so I'm happy to talk more with you regarding this topic, but the lockdowns, they are typically, they're temporary. They're not lasting for the full 24 hours in the day. And after the uh, investigation is completed, whether there's an investigation to use of force, credible intelligence, or even a tactical search operation, lockdowns are um, no longer in effect. And a little bit. Yeah, we, sh we should discuss and maybe even talk to those who are impacted because it's actually very detrimental to their well being. Yeah, I, I, I thank, thank you, uh, Felipe, and thank you, Commissioner, for uh, the uh, responses that you've provided. Um, respectfully, I would very much like to follow up. Um, I uh, believe I don't have the precise statistics in front of me, um, but many of the 200 
30 plus lockdowns that occurred in RNDC during the month of July were many hours of the day, perhaps not 24 hours of the day, but 10, 11, 12 hours of the day, long, long periods of time during which young people were locked in their cells. So I would very much like to, I absolutely appreciate the imperative to have safe facilities and also um, appreciate the imperative to have humane facilities and to ensure that um, the young people in RNDC are receiving uh, time out of their cells, are able to access services that are available to them, are able to engage in programming. So I would very much like to um, look at the data with you and follow up with you. And in the spirit of transparency, we've been sharing this data with you. So we're happy to speak to you about it. Thank you. I just have one more question Thank about you. the 5 a.m. I'm sorry. No. The 5 a.m. issue, you said that there, there were not a lot of steps were just coming in. The department made a very clear decision a number of years ago to change the lockout time from, from I think, 7 to 10 and 7 to 11 to 5 to 9. That was, and I'm surprised that you didn't change the, uh, the staffing similarly. Yes, um, not the staff and the changes can definitely change also, but um, depending on the facility, um, the organization, you know, um, total number of staff, you know, uh, that are present at that time, five in the morning, varies from seven to five. If you got to from like seven in the morning, we have more. Like a program, school, different services. We have poor production. There's, no, there's, there's a lot happening on that time in the morning. There's a lot happening at that time in the morning. As I said, that incident was particularly orchestrated um, by those individuals encrusting that housing area, and we responded as soon as we got to the area. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? Thank you, Commissioner Tender Chief. Chief. Um, but the health services provide an update now. Um, so we just present on that uh, Excuse me, Felipe. I, I'm sorry. Uh, so I'd like to ask a question on, on the, uh, the staffing. Sure. Before we go to the next item. Commissioner, you, you mentioned, you mentioned that, uh, you were presently doing recruitment, uh, that you presently have 150. Uh, correction officers being trained at the academy. Correct. Is this for to alleviate the attrition of the department? That is or correct. oh, it is. Yes. So it's not to get to bring it back to the original so team. Working, as you are aware, city council did not approve our headcount um, that we requested in the budget for 574 officers. Um, we are continuing to recruit to backfill the post for people leaving, and we, we, we did not get the additional funding for the 574 candidates that we'd asked for. Mm -hmm. So we are continuing to recruit, to manage, um, to onboard new staffing to assist the department. And this recruitment that you're doing, uh, do you have a schedule as to where the people are going to do recruitment, or, or are you just doing recruitment with the shovel concept? I'm sorry, I, I'm not following the question. The question is, yes. do you have a list of areas that you're focusing to go and do recruitment? Yes, our, our human resources team has that information on hand and I'm happy to share that with you as well on where they're recruiting. What type of recruiting are you doing? And I've mentioned the shovel concept. Do, are you familiar with that concept? No, I'm not. Okay. Uh, I think that sometimes in order to be able to fill positions in a particular agency, regardless where it goes, people just tend to go any place where they can go so that they can get uh, names or get give out applications to recruit for a particular department. Usually that's really detrimental to the agency because you recruit people that you don't really want in your department. And that's what I call the shovel concept. You just go and you just pick 
so that you could bring in people. Meanwhile, those people that you recruit, then at least 50% of those are NQs. And then after those NQs, after you do the character investigation, yeah. another 50% are, you know, are dismissed. So you end up with five. Right. So, um, you know, I like to know, where is it that you're focusing and going out to do your recruitment for the department? So the uh, department's human resources team, um, the AIU unit, um, the African investigation unit. Now you're giving me two different units now. You're giving me the... It falls under the human resources uh, umbrella, but AIU is our in applicant investigation unit, and they're doing targeted recruitment throughout the city. Uh, they're also, uh, I know that they're working with a, a firm to also recruit individuals in, in addition to civilians, but also on the uniform side. Happy to get that information for you. No, you, are you recruiting for uniform or are you recruiting for... A and non-uniform, using a, a research, a, a, a team to recruit for both parties. All right, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. That's Hi, good morning. Um, good morning. Yang, Senior Vice President of Health and Hospitals for Correctional Health Services. I'm uh, happy to give an update on uh, things that are going on in, at CHS. Um, by way of noticing uh, Beepin Zibetti, who is familiar to all of you, who was our chief of uh, mental health, he is our newly appointed uh, chief medical officer, so he's new in his job. Um, not new to their jobs, but uh, just recognizing them. Carlos Castellanos is our chief operations officer, nurse, uh, chief nursing officer, Nancy Arias. Chief of Staff, uh, Ashley Smith, um, our Director of Communications and Intergovernmental Affairs is uh, Jeanette Merrill, and her deputy is Nicole Lee, and they're both here to, to uh, answer your question. Obviously, their, their work exceeds what their titles are um, for a type of piece of team. Um, uh, you asked about sort of the update on infectious diseases. Uh, COVID is still with us. Um, we, as healthcare workers, are still following healthcare uh, regulations and masking and, and following all universal precautions. Um, we did just yesterday receive the bivalent booster, which is protected against the alpha and the two Omicron uh, variants, sub variants that are most mostly responsible for, for infections today. Um, and our staff, um, Nancy Arias, has trained everybody, so we are, we are ready to, to administer that. We're spending this week advising people again with the availability of this, this booster um, and uh, hopefully we'll begin administering uh, next week. Um, currently, our seven day PCR positivity is about 2.4%, um, and we have 15 patients currently with active infection. Um, the vaccine uptake has been low, um, has decreased uh, over the course of time of the, of the pandemic, as it has elsewhere uh, in, in the community and the city. Um, currently, about 52% of our patients have had at least one shot, um, and 33% currently in custody. And again, this number keeps changing as people come and go, um, are, fully, are fully vaccinated. Uh, Monkeypox, uh, uh, as it's more commonly known, FPV. We, uh, we have been screening, continue to screen at our intensively uh, screening uh, sites uh, across all the boroughs, as well as in the all our intake, um, which will always reach us through the health triage line. Um, we very, very thankfully have no cases um, in the jails of NPV, um, but we do, in, in large part, thanks to our relationship with our um, health and hospital system, we're able to secure on-site testing immediately um, uh, with, with um, NPV. Um, and again, um, Ms. Arias has trained her staff, so everybody is ready and able to administer interdermally should we need a post-exposure post uh, prophylaxis. We work with the City Health Department, DOHMH, um, and are sure immediate access should we, should we have that need. Um, and we would obviously work with the Department of Correction um, as needed if there were a case that required some contact investigation. Um, and the last of the infectious disease that I wanted to mention is flu. Um, flu season is upon us, um, and we are um, making that vaccine available in our clinical intakes. Um, and we'll be rolling that out as we as people become more aware that, in fact, summer is over. 
Um, the uh, other update that I wanted to, to share was um, on Narcan, um, which is a naloxone uh, um, as people focus on, on overdose prevention. Um, back in December of 2021, CHS proposed and, and got the concurrence from DOC to begin training our patients. Um, we have covered every single housing area. Uh, we've trained over a thousand patients. Um, that number obviously changes as people um, enter the system and, and are released back into uh, back home. Um, so we do retrain. We've trained um, at least over a thousand people so far, but that, that's ongoing. Um, and Narcan really is uh, the the distribution is really part of our Keep program, which is the country's largest and oldest methadone. Uh, and view program. Um, so um, we are distributing Narcan also in the visit house. Last month we um, trained and distributed kits to 832 people um, to bring back to their community. And we think that's, that's uh, an effort that we will continue to work with the department in terms of other places that can, uh, where we can um, jointly work on distribution and availability of those kits. Um, and finally, we really wanted to, our uh, very exciting one is, is Just Home. Um, which is our name for our supportive housing project. Um, this is a proposal that we put together with the uh, city's housing and preservation development agency. Um, and the city recently um, this summer announced uh, the Fortune Society would be developing and managing the, this this program. This is this is fabulous. Um, it, it would be the city's first permanent supportive housing for people with medical issues who have justice involved. There is no such thing in the city. Um, people, as you know, would stay in jail um, when they don't need to, only because of uh, there isn't a robust and a safe place um, to which they can be discharged and care for their medical issues. Um, this this project would be, um, we're very excited about it, um, would have studio apartments, about 70 apartments um, would be available, um, really life-changing and, and life-saving initiative and for, for, for uh, engaging uh, elected officials and stakeholders currently in that process, along with HPD and Um I think that's the brief summary. I can answer questions. Yes, that kind of team. Thank you, Patsy. Yes, it's incredible the housing project has been built. Hopefully, we can get past the community and push it out. Thanks. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Very well. Uh, any questions, my boy? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, hey, uh, so yesterday, uh, BOC released um, the report on deaths in custody from 2021. Uh, and it's available on our website. Um, as we know, in 2021, uh, 16 people died in BOC custody. And this year, thus far, there's been 13 deaths. Uh, and this is never easy to talk about, um, to write something called a death report if someone actually dies in probably the worst inhumane place they can in isolation, which is on the island. I think, you know, I, I want to believe that all of us don't want anyone to die on that is out. Um, but the, the, the report kind of highlighted um, some of those things that are preventable, that maybe if one of the officers may be more around, this around, maybe someone's life will be saved. And it's difficult, you know, folk inside have a loved one, uh, and to, to realize that after a week, I'm going to commit suicide, uh, that was preventable, I think is the most disheartening thing um, that we talk about, you know, with this report. I want to, I want to, and before I got that, I should, I should definitely thank um, the committee that, that worked on on this report. Um, uh, Deputy General Counsel uh, Melissa Sintron Hernandez and her team. Um, the report, of course, the land that was the director and the rest of the team that really put this robust report together to highlight and to allow the city to know that we must do better. And I think one of the things, because this is not a, a at least I don't, I don't want to make this, you know, a, at least at this point, an us against them. You know, these investigations, this board investigation, um, 
we wanted to figure out how we can prevent this in the future. What can we do to prevent these deaths in the future? And I think that's important to highlight. We want to figure out how do we stop this? You can't go onto the island and die. And you serve and facing a sentence, or serving a six month sentence, or whatever that is. Right? What can we do together to make sure not another death happens? We can't come to the next meeting and I'm reporting on another death when we know these things are preventable. So the report, you know, talks about this, talks about some of the things that we can do. Uh, and, and, and again, you know, when we think about about it. It's a lot of hopelessness, a lot of despair. Um, when people, you know, suicidal ideations, mental health, um, anxiety, depression, overdoses. But we got to figure out how we make these tours happen every 30 minutes the way they're supposed to. How do we make sure that we can prevent, especially a death that's happening in front of a correction officer? And they fail to provide support, help. Yeah. Someone can't commit suicide, cut their throat with a razor in 10 minutes. Correction officers in front of them looking at them. We, we know, we all know, there's no excuse for that. All of us understand that. That's true. But I just think, you know, for me, it's very personal. And, it's, and it should be personal for all of us. That no matter what, we do everything possible to make certain the suicides, the deaths, end on right design. And we have to do this together. May I say something? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I think most of us know uh, by listening to the news, CDC has told us that suicide is a, is a national problem. There's been increased suicide attempts. So whatever goes on in a larger society is going to be mimicked in the facility. It's just that simple. I, I, my, my question is, and a, and a statement I have, are we trying to increase the number of suicide aids, inmate suicide aids, in the facilities, on all tours, and in addition to that, have alternates for when that inmate goes to court or for whatever reason can't work. Uh, yes, the officers should be making 15 minute tours depending or 30 minute tours depending, but there's so much that can go on in an eight hour period. So that's the reason suicide aids were instituted in the first place. When we had them years ago, I'm former corrections, we, have, we didn't have that many suicides or they were caught pretty quickly. So that's a question that I have. And before you answer that, I, I do wanna also state that um, I think we need to, to, to look at the showers in the intake. They, they lend themselves to committing suicide because of the gratings. You can, so I think we need to look at maybe reconfiguring those. And uh, my statement is, and it may be seem a little out there, but I think we should also look at technology. See what technology is available to curb suicides and even uh, make us aware that an inmate is ill. I not long ago read an article that there's some facilities in the UK that are giving inmates something like a Fitbit. I don't know if it will work with our population, but it's a thought. And it lets you know if they're committing suicide, if, they're, if their blood pressure is low, if, you know, it, it lets you know their health. So whatever we can start doing to look at technology to help the officer who is overworked to do their job and employ the inmates to be suicide aides and maybe pay them a little more than the other inmates are getting paid, I think we should do it. So my question is, are we increasing the number of suicide aides in the department? We 
in fact, we just recently, um, with respect to the SBAs, the suicide prevention aids, we recently increased their pay. Um, and they're actually one of the highest working paid details. We have, at this time, we have 35 SBAs in AMKC, um, 12 in GRBC, and RDC has 10, um, VCBC has 12. And so we're continually trying to recruit. Um, individuals in custody for this. How many uh, housing areas are in AMKC? You said you got 35 SPAs. How many housing areas are there? At this time, I, I don't, don't know offhand. Let me, uh, approximately. Yeah. Three tours. Every house, three tours. You know, it's interesting. You raised this. This is something that yeah. we're, we're talking about internally. This data reduces suicides tremendously. Yes, in addition to the 30 minute tours, we're using the tour. Exactly. For officers when they're conducting their tours. Okay, thank you. Um, just to follow up to that, does the department have a target number for the number of suicide prevention aids that you would need in order to have full coverage so that you could have the observation um, that you need for people in custody who are on suicide watch? Um, and so what is, do you have that number? What is that number? Um, and what are the barriers to recruitment to uh, reaching um, a, a, you know, a fully uh, full complement of suicide prevention aids. Um, so that's kind of one set of questions. You mentioned you had raised the pay, um, wondering what the new pay is um, and um, and if that could be a barrier that the department has authority to further address um, by looking at, at the pay. There would be about five per housing area. So the question is, how many housing areas are there? You got three tours. So that's three SPAs off the top then you should have maybe two alternates for, for when the inmate is not available. So that's the answer to that question. Thank so, you. So uh, the question with respect to what the pay was before, it was a dollar, we raised it to 145, and we're exploring to see if we can, you know, we'll talk internally to see how we can raise it further. Um, our, you know, priority is staffing the intakes, as we've discussed, this is something that we have ongoing. And so to evaluate the uh, staffing in the housing areas that are open, we have to sort of analyze internally as to how we can staff with the SBAs throughout the facilities. Has one, one second. Yeah, I just wanted to, to follow up to say, I think having, you know, this model has been around for a long time and obviously we're um, seeing with increasing alarm uh, the amount of self-harm and, and deaths by suicide. And it seems like that um, would would be a very compelling reason to kind of immediately come up with, you know, what is the number that you would want and then find a way to get there, um, you know, with a population of over, over 5,000 um, to be able to reach um, that number of needed suicide prevention aids in order to just provide this additional layer of, of protection for people's lives. I, I agree. And I just want to note that there's a, like a screening process. They have to be a little classification. People also have to apply. So we've been doing a lot of recruitment, sort of engagement with individuals in custody about this role, and we'll continue to do it. But I just want to note that for you as well, that consideration. Thank you. I, just, um, I had one follow-up. Um, under, under our minimum standards, the the SPAs um, must be in the new admission areas. And I have a question about this, the course of this summer and right now, are there SPAs in all of the housing areas, or in all of the areas being used for new admissions at EMTC? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, SPAs in all of the city's housing. I have it in the mixed with observation housing areas. And two weeks ago, they came in and they conducted tests for thick housing areas, and I'm waiting for the results right now. So we'll have a surplus 
So when they go out into general population, they're all they're already been trained at the SBA and they'll be able to you know, in a facility will be sent out to. I appreciate that. But my question is at EMTC in the areas being used for intake, are there SPAs and have there been SPAs this summer? In my intake area? Yes. 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 I, I think uh, Julio's comments were the most important. I would just like to say that uh, although there is a uh, an increased uh, rate of suicide uh, in, in actually during this period, the last two cases of suicide, both in the month of August, were not um, were not COVID related cases. One of them was someone who had who was known to be suicidal, who had attempted suicide twice during this current incarceration, who had come back from state hospital, killed himself a day, day or two afterwards. The other person was a 68-year-old physician who was facing, who was going to get sentenced for 20 years. He was housed in a, dorm, in a dormitory which, where there was no B officer, he took his his linen and into the shower because there was no one there and and hung himself. So these these are these are these are these are preventable. Maybe even if even even if there's a national national tendency, they're preventable. But these these were really preventable and and we should learn uh, that we should figure out what we didn't do to prevent these steps. Any other questions? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I, I have a question. I mean, last time, last time that we had a hearing, um, the commissioner was very enthusiastic uh, about implementing summer youth employment for the first time in Rikers. Can, can we get an update of how many youths were able to take a part of that opportunity and how did it go? We'll follow up with those numbers immediately after the meeting. Do you have any sense? I mean, being such an important new initiative, how did it go? So it's not on the agenda, but I'm happy to follow up with you after the meeting on the numbers. Okay. Um, I had one additional question. Or Kind of area of questions in relation to the death um, report issued by the board. Um, so, with respect to drugs that are coming into the facility, uh, into facilities, um, based on the data and information investigations that DOC is doing, um, what is that showing you um, in terms of where, how the how the contraband, how the drugs are getting into the jails? Um, and what um, what methods are you using in order to to detect them? So, you know, we see that um, searches of facilities have gone up considerably from um, I think over the course of the year from about seventeen thousand to twenty nine thousand. Um, but or, I'm sorry, seven yes, yeah, seventeen thousand to twenty nine thousand. But the actual discovery um, of drugs during those searches have only gone up from about 47 to 55, which just shows like a really low yield from searches. Um, so I'm wondering where else you're encountering drugs, if you're finding them through the mail, if you're finding them in other other uh, kinds of points besides the in-facility searches, and just generally any information you can share um, given um, the the impact this is having um, uh, on the population um, and contributions toward the depth we're seeing in custody. Paul Techman, the new general counsel, and many, many of the board members will be here. This is obviously a, a issue of enormous importance mm -hmm. to us, um, not only because of the suicide issue, but just in terms of the, um, the general population and um, control and um, with life. Um, one of the things that has become a priority for us is trying to stop drugs from entering the band. 
And that seems to be a great source of the drugs that are generating. And what one finds if one looks at the reports is you see a lot of fentanyl entering the blue mail um, or the packages. What seems to happen is that literally get a page of a book laced with fentanyl and get his note that um, laced with fentanyl. Um, and then the page uh, is ripped out. Um, the person it's sent to, in the corner, you don't need much fentanyl. There'll be much fentanyl get high, and sadly, there'll be much fentanyl to overdose. Um, they'll rip out a page uh, and then sell the rest of the page to others. Um, we are probably going to be coming to your way in the near future uh, and seeing the variants of the way mail is delivered. Um, there is the ability to scan mail, send it to inmate tablets. So exploring that, um, you have a policy that says mail has to be open in an individual's preference. That would prevent scanning. Standing. Um, my guess is we'll be able to persuade you that scanning and sending it to incarcerated individuals uh, on their tablets is a much more effective way of invading their privacy. Um, no one would read the correspondence, but we will try to keep out um, drugs that way. In terms of packages, the state of my understanding that has gone to a system where the packages, the only packages they would accept are from outside vendors. So if you want to send in a book, um, Amazon send in the book. Um, whether we should be doing that, we're still under discussion. Um, it's currently important that if you're incarcerated, you get packages from your loved ones, you get correspondence from your loved ones. It's also currently important to keep drugs out of the facility. So that requires us to consider um, different ways of handling mail, and requires us to consider different ways of handling packages. As I say, you should not be surprised in the near future uh, to come to you uh, and uh, I want to revisit the issue of, of how mail makes into the facility. They don't have to get into that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, there, are, there are other ways that obviously drugs get, get brought into the facility. You reported that uh, there was an increase in drug findings uh, when there were no visits from uh, from family members. Uh, um, that quite possibly, and we know that occasionally you you find your own officers occasionally. Uh, yeah. No, I mean, really, we get very little in drugs or statements, but very little in recreation visits. That's not our problem. Who is a patient? It's coming in. Well, I, my understanding, and I, I've only been around this jail system for 40 years, that <laughs> the uh, drugs come in in many ways. They come in civilian staff, they come in, in, in CO staff, they come in uh, you know, maybe in visits, not less likely. And if, you're, if it's true that uh, you're not concerned with uh, um, persons getting drugs during during a visit, you might open up your policy regarding contact visits for people who had drugs in, involved in their in their in their past. Uh, but um, your uh, your your expert um, who's doing uh, um, who's being brought on by let's lose his name right now. The uh, the expert who's doing classification for you and the expert who's uh, who's going to design your Restricted housing policy. He has called uh, for uh, scanning of all civilian and officer staff as a way of dealing with uh, lethal epidemics of drug um, overdose in, in, in a jail in San Diego. And the numbers are similar here. So I think that's something the department should consider as well. Uh, I have two questions. And you probably say, okay, here he goes again. How do we handle uh, suicide attempts at the court pens? How you doing, Mr. Ramos? Um, with that, that, that's a very good question. As far as um, 
the sewer side, basically it all depends on the officer because we don't have the SBA side of suicide um, and excuse me, side of the court been trying to detect a suicide, but um, that's something that we definitely could look at because we do have work that that uh, that go there to do sanitation, so we could explore looking to have an SBA inside the courts, but definitely right now at this point, it's all based on the officer, the correctional officer. I, I think that maybe perhaps uh, the system that you use at the court pens, where the officers are vigilant and look for this and prevent uh, the uh, suicides, that maybe perhaps we could implement that in our in our facilities as well. Uh, I know that in the past there were many people who tried to commit suicide after they woke up after being drunk all day and they they were arraigned at court and they wake up in a cell in the court pen this is something that they didn't could not accept because they let their families down and as a result they try to commit suicide because they couldn't uh face themselves being in incarcerated uh and they were probably doing something that they should have been doing to begin with the the other uh uh question that i had is what are we doing to to uh monitor the the drugs that come in that do not come in through the mail and do not come in through the visits uh, so they must be coming in somehow. Uh, they're either coming in through civilian employees and uniform employees. And uh, are, what are we doing in order to be able to correct that condition? Basically, what we do, we reach out to our um, investigation division and have them even come assist us, you know, we make patrols through our facility and especially at the front gate areas for our um, uniform and non-uniform staff entering the facility. So that's something that we definitely do at this point. Yes, ma'am. Um, could we also um randomly use the canines? Yes, you know, just randomly so that if it's coming through employees, civilian or uniform. If they know, like, uh, do they still randomly drug test? Yes, yes. Okay, so that's that that worked, right? So random canine units on an ongoing basis might work, and also um, investigations can plant people. You know, you have inmates that'll tell you what's going on. Do we do that? Is that still done? I'm sure it's yeah. done. I'm sure. Okay, so. Um, just one follow-up question to that. I mean, given the proliferation um, of drugs and overdoses that we're seeing, what of um, those procedures are new? Are there is any of that um, with respect to screening of of staff who come into facilities? Is any of it new or enhanced, or has the department just kind of continued to um, implement the same screening processes as historically you've done? Um, right now, it's basically just more enhanced, you know, due to the uptick of uh, the drug fines to be introduced. Um, it's just more or less enhanced and just a better communication, you know, just doing it in real time before I reach out to the investigation division. And what does enhanced mean? Enhanced, just uptick, just, uh, you know, just being very aggressive with it. You know, so we get the information, but as you know, most investigation it takes a little time for them to build cases. So we're very aggressive and continuously reaching out to the um, deputy commissioner of investigations, you know, to put us assistance on on that on that level. And then as far as with the um, um, drugs for um, coming in for the person incarcerated, we use our own canine units for that. You know, especially inside the mail room and just make control inside the facility. So. It's, it's a dual effort on both parts, you know, for the population and also for our staff working. Um, and so with respect to the screening procedures um, for staff coming into the facility, um, you, you mentioned it sounds like you're doing enhanced investigations. It sounds like that's maybe after something is um, identified, but what about the front end screening procedures? Has 
there been any enhancement to those efforts? Yes, um, basically, uh, um, special operations division took all the front gates, you know, to, um, historically, facility, you know, took it out the front gate. So special operations division um, took over the front gates at this time and then worked in partnership with investigation at times. Like, like I just said, it's an answer. Sometimes, you know, we get a tip or we get a clue where we out to them and tell him to also bring his his team up front. So he'll bring his hand, his handlers along with his canines, you know, at the front, at, like I said, at the front um, front gate. And also during inside the um, administrative offices, the car with whatever we think, you know, is gone. But at that point, we turn it over to the investigation division. Okay. And, and I, this is something we can follow up on. I have additional questions, but I know we also have a, a long agenda to get to, but some more, we would like more information about, you know, actual procedures that have changed. So, yeah, and just, just to echo what the chief says, you know, all, all members of staff, regardless of rank, they go through a securing, they go through a security screening before entering the facilities. SOD is is over all of that process. It's been taken away from the facilities. They manage that process and we work with our partners in law enforcement to investigate any suspected incident in which a member of service may be introducing contraband right. into the facility and take swift action to intervene right. and hold them accountable. So I just want to know that. <clears throat> Um, could the, could the Department of Correctional and Health talk to us about treatment and services available for those that are struggling with substance abuse? I mean, we keep on hearing about, you know, how to deter substances from coming in, which I think is um, a good strategy, but uh, I want to hear what we're doing to help people move away from addiction. I'll defer to partners in CHS to provide that information. Hi, good morning. I think the question was about the treatment services available for substances uh, for individuals that are incarcerated. So, well, how are they widely available? How can we make sure that we can prevent overdoses? Sure. And what, what role sure. treatment plays in that? Starting with HEAP, which is our opioid treatment program, we perform screenings on admission um, and education around uh, opioid treatment and the available resources we have. Uh, you know, the majority of individuals who meet criteria for keep are enrolled over 75%. Uh, so that's an important uh, intervention that we have. Uh, in addition, the mental health services, when they're working with individuals, are also thinking about poor women's substance use, which is prevalent uh, to a high degree in our population, but both in general population and then in the MO. Uh, so we do have treatment groups in the students code aimed at general mental illness and treatment as well as substance treatment. Uh, and we are continuously talking to our Department of Corrections that uh, the liaison as well as internally about how to expand those resources too. Thank you. One brief add uh, for, 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 for uh, Board Member Ramos's comment about uh, suicides in uh, in um, units in the uh, in the courthouse units. Uh, the last the, the last suicide in, in the Bronx. In the courthouse uh, was a person. You, you don't count that as a, this person killed themselves. Uh, he committed suicide and attempted suicide in the jail. They were unconscious. They had to go to Lincoln Hospital. They were on a ventilator for a couple of weeks, and uh, you dismiss them from your service and don't count that as a suicide. Uh, we do, but that man uh, had attempted suicide in the Bronx pens four months before. So, so I think Mr. Ramos's question is is well taken, and we, you 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 can see what you can learn from from that, and mental health is as well in terms of uh, uh, prevention. That's all. thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to ENTC essential intake updates. Uh, the board is deeply concerned about the overcrowding, delay, and the EMTC centralized intake. We have asked each agency to give us updates on staffing and processes at EMTC. At the July meeting, CHS gave us a PowerPoint presentation with suggestions for how DOC could help improve the patient flow. And we have not yet obtained a response from DOC explaining their reaction to the suggestion despite our request. Before we turn to those updates from each agency, I want to address one EMTC problem 
that we have hoped to have solved this summer, but we have unfortunately been unable to make progress. The board has called for the dismantling of an enclosed lock cage and the showers and the intake at EMTC because of the great risk that they have people in custody and very dangerous. People in custody have hurt themselves by banging their bodies against the wire cage while locked in this area, harming themselves in apparent protest of being locked in or because they need mental health services. Theoretically, the cage is used for decontamination, shining off pepper spray after the use of force. However, there is no real proper use for this locked cage. The person in custody could easily pass clothing or literature, literature through the gaps in the wires or to hang themselves. It is unreasonably risky. The danger that a person can be left in that locked cage is too high. The risk is too great. An alternative exists. There are showers in the de-escalation areas that can be used to shower after you go uh, away. Intake is no longer the place a person in custody should be stuck after a UOF. That is what de-escalation areas were built for. Uh, in fact, there are some uncaged, more normal showers in intake, right next to the locker room cage. DOC suddenly does not need the cage. We are disappointed that it has not been dismantled despite repeated requests from this board this summer. So we're going to ask you again now. Um, um, so I'm going to turn to the condition of for, for response. So, um, with respect to the question on the showers, um, I just want to note that we um, issued a command level order yesterday. Um, which states that the decontamination shall only occur in the, the in the actual de-escalation unit. And that decontamination is prohibited. Um, Will it be dismantled then, or what, what purpose does it have to continue to exist if we're not allowed to use it? If people still, if, if there are incidents where people need to shower, um, we will still utilize it, but it will not be used for decontamination purposes. But why would a locked shower, I'm sorry, I understand what you're saying, but why would a person need to shower within a, a locked cage? I mean, there may be instances where someone may defecate on themselves or they may need to utilize the shower. The shower will still be there, but not for decontamination no. I think, purposes. I think Maybe it would help to describe what the what the layout mm -hmm. looks like um, in the EMTC intake area adjacent. There are a series of shower stalls that are opened um, one after another with a sort of brick and mortar in between each of them so that people in custody cannot touch each other when they're in the shower. Um, and then at the end of the row. There is a shower that looks like that, but for the fact, there is a cage that has four edges and a ceiling made out of a graded type of metal with holes that are big enough to put a ligature through. And the front of it has a door with a lock on it. So it's, it's, a, it's a cage within a regular shower cell that's right next to a bunch of other regular shower cells in the intake area. And what you are saying is that your command level order mandates that after a use of force or uh, you know, when there's a need for someone to take the shower, because like you say, they know. So if there is, if, if, if there is, that shower pen will not be used for any decontamination purposes. Okay. But what purposes would it serve to lock someone in a cage in a shower area? Again, that area will not be utilized for decontamination purposes. Then I think what the board has been asking all summer, could you please remove the cage because it's bound to be used again someday if it continues to exist. For what purpose would you keep it? Okay, in the shower? We, will, we, will, we, will, we will remove the cage. Thank you. Thank you, that's great. And I, is there a timeline for the removal? We will we will discuss that. We will discuss internally and get back to you on the time. Great. I, I think we're all going to rest easier at night knowing that you're doing that. Thank you. 
Any other comments? On EMTC? Yeah. Well, we, we've, uh, we're aware that uh, through, um, we don't know, I don't know what happened yesterday, but throughout August and in July, there were uh, our staff and our board, board members visited the, the facilities and uh, in EMTC, there, there was substantial overcrowding in the, in the intake. There were delays in, uh, in, in, in intake and it, uh, People were spend a long time there, and it's a it's a continuing problem, uh, as we as we've described before. I just wondered uh, uh, if you have this, what 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 are you going to do to uh, move? Is it a problem with the degree of uh, CHS uh, rap rapidity in, uh, in in clearing people medically? Uh, is it what is it, and how are you going to fix? It? So actually in July and August, um, our numbers were pretty good. We were 14 to 16 hours on average. We have experienced some delays. We are working in conjunction with CHS. We're sharing their data with ours to ensure that individuals that are running high on time are expedited to the clinic and we follow them through. And we are working together to ensure that they are expedited to the clinic in an expeditious manner. We are ensuring that upon their arrival, they are immediately processed and they are searched and, you know, prepared to go to the clinic. And um, over the last week or two, we work and our members are getting better. We have work to do. It's work in process, but it's getting much better. Okay, maybe we'll we'll we'll, we'll revisit this because we we reviewed pictures after pictures after pictures of right. and, and you know you you've seen the same you've been there and seen it as well. Well, Dr. Cohen, that's because they come in in large buses. So if they come in at 30 at a time, when you look, you will see 30, but they are being moved in an expeditious manner. Okay. Um, I, I think I, we, we believe that there's a problem in your working with CHS to resolve the problem. So that's great. Yeah, we're working internally together. We have a good working relationship and we're going to make it work. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Could, could I just could I just yeah. ask a question just following up on that to I, I very much appreciate hearing that uh, DOC and CHS are working together and I'm curious as to how you've um, examined what the drivers of delay are uh, in processing folks through um, the intake new intakes as well as folks who have already been at EMTC, whom I understand have, I, I visited a couple of months ago EMTC and in the front of the unit, um, there were a couple of pens with a number of people who said that they had already been through the initial intake process and they were in those pens, some for, extended periods of time awaiting appointments, awaiting screenings. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in knowing what the dynamic is in that section of uh, the intake and what, what you're working on with CHS in terms of understanding what the drivers are and jointly uh, modifying as necessary your workflows to ensure um, that folks are not in either set of pens, either the brand new admissions or folks who are already um, in the facility uh, and waiting to be seen in the clinic. So, I, I, so the commissioner and Dr. Katz spoke specifically about this issue. And Dr. Katz, my understanding is he indicated that you know they're committed to sharing data, and we are too. And so in that vein, our data teams um, met yesterday, and they're going to have ongoing conversation because data is what's going to inform this discussion. And so that's what we've been looking. We're going to be looking at the data that speaks to this, so we're able to optimize and ensure that individuals are seen quickly. We've also brought on a individual to do workforce optimization. And so in, in, in the spirit of working through this, in conjunction with CHS, we hope to, with the data, we are able to see where we can tighten up areas of be, people being seen on time. 
and process through the team. Thank you. That's uh, very encouraging to hear. Who is the, the individual who is doing workforce optimization? Is a consultant or no, we, is we a. We just brought him on our own Mac team. He just started uh, yesterday. Okay, well, we're certainly looking forward to uh, hearing more about the data sharing and what you're finding. Yes. If, if there aren't other questions about EMTC, one other question that arose um, uh, back when um, I was at EMTC and I believe has persisted is that um, folks are staying at the facility past the 14 days that are anticipated and or the the maximum of 14 days and um, wondering what you're doing to look into that and to facilitate people who uh, need to be assigned to other facilities moving out of EMTC. We have DC Miller, who's onboarded in July, and he's head of our custody management and classification and facility operations. And this morning, and he works closely with uh, Warden Harvey to ensure that individuals get housed after they meet the quarantine time within EMTC. And so that's an ongoing that's an ongoing thing, ensuring that people get to their housing areas timely. Welcome, uh, welcome, and I look forward to hearing more about uh, that and reducing the amount of time folks are staying in EMTC in uh, future meetings. If there are no further questions on that point, then we're going to move to the next agenda item, which is uh, violence indicators. We have a Deck, Denise, could share the screen. This, this PowerPoint will be available on our website after the meeting, and I will try and get through it um, pretty quickly for you so that we can move on to the next agenda item after violence. <laughs> Thing. There were 40 slashings and stabbing incidents in August of 2022, two less than in the year to date monthly average of 42. From June to August of 2022, GRVC had a total of 63 slashing and stabbing incidents, approximately triple the rate of the next highest facility, which was EMTC. There were 176 serious injury incidents in the jails in June of 2022, seven higher than the year-to-date monthly average of 169. The next chart uh, pertains to use of force. Class A use of force is the designation for resulting in serious injuries. Over the first seven months of this year, there were 247 Class A use of force incidents and 18 resulting, I'm sorry, 247 resulting in serious injury for people in custody and 18 resulting in serious injury for staff. This is the same one that I have in my bed. Could we go back? Okay, this one is the one I was looking for. Thank you. Um, the majority of use of force 
uh, incidents don't result in a serious injury and they're labeled class C, um, resulting in no injury to staff or people in custody and including the use of a chemical agent spray. And those consistently comprise about two thirds of all monthly use of force and 84% of the total in July this year. In July, class A use of force which includes incidents that require medical treatment beyond the prescription of over-the-counter um, aspirin, et cetera, represent only 6% of all use of force. The total, number, the total number of weapons recovered in the first seven months of this year was 3,774, which is 146% more than the total number of weapons recovered last year in the same time period. Um, the total number of inmate monthly fights increased 13% from 395 in January to 448 in June. There's been a 22% year-to-date decrease in fights from last year to this year. Um, and one should note that when housing areas um, do not have a, a B officer or staff present, there will be an underreporting of fights, so we can't vouch for the accuracy of this data. Thanks. Um, is our last uh, following a significant increase of special searches, tactical ESU K9 and special team from February to May of this year. In June and July, those special searches actually decreased and facility searches nearly doubled from 17,000 to 29,000 searches. Despite this near doubling of the facility searches, the drug discoveries as a result of facility searches only increased from 47 to 55, which I believe um, Frey had mentioned a little bit earlier. Thank you, Amanda. Um, Misha, um, you have a point to, to counter some of the violence, kind of what has been working, what, what hasn't been working, uh, what have we learned, uh, what is the prediction for violence stats in the coming months, Chief, you, you're managing this. Okay. Yes. Um, you know, to answer your question, um, we're basically still sticking to the plan. Uh, we initiated it at RNDC. Um, you know, um, but we have learned that we can just transition going over to GRBC. That's the building that you said you had, um, mm -hmm. the building 17. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we just trying to learn from that. And basically, you know, um, I learned to more or less utilize the data, see what the main drivers are to some of these incidents. So I'm paying attention to like the, uh, the day of the week, the time of the day, the areas, the SRG affiliations, you know, um, and basically the reason for the incidents and even staff involvement in it. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to utilize all of this to learn, lessons learned from RNDC to build a better product over there at GRBC at this time. And um, right now, um, what we're doing, we're, blend, we're blending the housing units up. And, you know, and, and adults, they told me, because, you know, I'm there. I'm not working, you know, virtually and this, that. I have 10 down in these buildings. And I'm talking to them, and, and the gentleman is telling me, well, you know, we're not, we're not the kids, we're not the young adults, you know, we want to live with, with our other SRB membership. So they're giving us pushback, so it's challenging, though. Know. But, um, you know, we, we're going to stick to the plan that Commission believe that's set in place. And that's the bottom line, though. And like I said, I'm, I'm going to take the data that we have, and we're going to learn from it. You know, just build a better, um, you know, um, product from it at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Questions, yeah. yeah. Um, do you find that the um, credible messengers make a big difference? I know they're in RNDC, and it appears that they've um, their being there has reduced violence uh, in the facility. What are your thoughts on the credible messengers and GRVC? You know, uh, uh, it's a little different because these guys, uh, these gentlemen, they, they're much older. So, like, you know, but what, what we're working on right now, trying to get some um, mentorship from outside to come on, you know, like we have different, um, you know, um, faith-based um, groups that want to help. So now that's what we're looking into, 
them just speaking on because you got to remember whatever happened inside the city, it comes over to um to right the guy. Let's be real about that. So it definitely comes over, but it is more contained. It's more and it's much more challenging. But um, DLC, we're we're up for the task. Thank you. Thank you. See you there. Building on 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 the question about credible messengers, um, can, can you talk a little bit more about even their presence at RNDC? Um, talking to young young people last week, um, many of them are doing their best to try to get along, even though they're from different affiliations. But they actually were very clear that they're not getting support or mediation uh, as they need. Do you need more credible message, messengers? Do you need more mediation? Do you need more violence interrupter programs? Uh, even at RNDC, uh, at least the voice of young, young people is that we need more of it. We free, they felt that they have to kind of figure it out on their own. Yeah, you know, Felipe. Uh, the more the merrier, the more you know, much more better. Because the um, the young the young adults are the future of you know of the of the city. You know, like like they're going to be our, our future citizens. So I definitely like to invest in them. So if you can give me more, you know, messages that that will assist us in, in carrying out the task, we definitely welcome it. Though. Okay, let's work on that together. Thank you. Anybody here from the program, right? Any other questions? I'm seeing anybody that I know. Who are the others? Torres. So we'll move on to the um, the last item on our agenda for the public comment period, which is the de-escalation units. Um, the board staff has been closely monitoring the department's implementation of the de-escalation units, which were uh, one part, a component of the board's RMAS rules. And as we discussed at the top of the meeting, there are many elements of the RMAF rules that have been suspended by executive emergency executive orders. Um, but over the spring and um, over the spring and by the time summer began, the department was implementing the part of RMAS that has to do with de-escalation units. Um, and that that part of our rules is now in Full force and effect. And so the de escalation units, um, the DOC directive was issued at the beginning of the year. The first placement in one of the units that opened was in um, the end of January at Rosie's. And then over the following months, they opened and are now fully operationalized in all of the facilities to our understanding. And I've seen pictures of uh, of them in all of the facilities. Um, so as per our DOC rules and DOC policy, the stated purpose of de-escalation units is to provide temporary placement for individuals who've been in an incident which requires that they be removed from their current housing area to de-escalate the situation. Um, they may need to decontaminate, um, which as we discussed earlier, means taking a shower after they've been exposed to chemical agents um, to, help, to help get those off of their body. Um, or they may just, the department may just need time to determine what the suitable permanent housing for them is after that incident and who did what and where they should go next. Um, the maximum placement length allowed is six hours. De-escalation unit cells, so are, are basically like a regular housing area cell, but the, the metal bed does not have a mattress and people are not supposed to be in there for more than six hours. Um, since July 12th, the department has issued emergency variance declarations um, for more than 43 people. Um, I know there were some this week. I'm not sure how much higher the count is right now. Um, but as of, as of a few days ago, it was at least 43 people who spent longer than the maximum allowable time of six hours in the de-escalation units. And so the board has questions about the use of the emergency variance declarations and why it is so prevalent. But the board is also concerned about supervision issues in the de-escalation areas, record keeping issues, and the continued use of intake areas sometimes as places that people are held after an incident or a use of force. 
Um, and as we discussed earlier, we were concerned about also the use of intake showers rather than de-escalation showers. Um, so we're, we're hoping that, uh, Commissioner, you might be able to address those concerns and explain what the current state of the de-escalation areas is and what your future plans for it are. Do you think it's going well? Good morning. Good morning. My name is Alan Robertson, the Executive Director of InterGov Affairs with the Department. Happy to speak a little bit on our progress so far with the de-escalation units. So as the board is aware, the department implemented de-escalation as of July 1st across all facilities. And just a little bit of context um, for the usage of the units. We've had in the months of July and August, a total of 350 placements and 15% of those placements we have found did surpass the six hour mark. Um, reasons why that might be the case, oftentimes, um, so we are monitoring placement and length of stay in the unit with a tracking system. And we're working through staff sort of training and compliance with that tracking um, system to ensure that when somebody approaches the five hour mark, we prepare for their departure from the unit. And if they approach a six hour mark, you know, we certainly make the board aware. So we continue to work through some staff training and sort of reinforcement around that tracking system, that electronic tracking system. But it is our goal to have that as an electronic system versus logbooks so that we can utilize, le you know, leverage technology and actually know when people are coming and going from the unit. So it's certainly some, something that we're um, continuing to work with staff through. As you know, this is certainly new and drastically new operation for the department utilizing these units. We're only a month, two months in now, so we will continue to work with staff to be any issues as they come up. Is there any board questions? Uh, there's several units where it appears they're not the de escalation units are not being used. Um, is, it, is that the case? So the facilities use, utilize the de escalation units when in order, you know, in order to de escalate after an incident. Now, we found some challenges with that, like certain housing areas, the placement of the house in relation to other houses, like NKC, for, for instance, um, does present a challenge with moving the population in a given house from perhaps from one side of the building all the way across to the other where the unit is. So challenges like this, we're trying to work through to figure out how we can better utilize these units. Um, similarly, if the de-escalation unit identified is not close to the clinic, that presents a challenge for us because, of course, we need to bring people to the clinic after an incident, right? And that's the priority. So we are, you know, working with the facilities. We meet actually on a monthly basis um, with two deputy commissioners who are helping us sort of ensure compliance with, with de-escalation to figure out how we can work around these challenges. And it certainly will keep the board informed, you know, as we as we problem solve. You know, I went to, the, the, I think, the de-escalation unit at AMPC uh, in August and it had not been used uh, since July 8th. It was filthy. I mean, there's food, you know, in the uh, corridor. Um, and I know there have been some places in NKC in, in August. Yeah. Um, we'll continue to keep you, of course, you know, apprised. And of course, the unit, if and when somebody is placed in the unit, it, it, you know, staff are dispatched to that unit to work the unit. So there should be a. My case is not that, uh, that people are not using the de escalation units and instead using the intake, which I think they're doing. No, where, where are they where are they taking them? They are either they're either decontaminating a shower or in a sink for policy, or you know they're going to the clinic immediately after a violent incident. And they're not they're not placing them in any in any other unit. No, 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 no. Or they're secured in the house after the incident. Oh, I see. Well, okay. Yes, yes, yes. That, that, that's that's an improvement, I think. Yes. Um, the other question I have is I don't understand what your um, emergency variance is. Re represent some of them are sure. some of them are days four five six seven eight days after the, the event has happened i don't know what you're what you're declaring Sorry. at that at that point and if 15 percent of the of the of the people in these units would are going too long it's not an emergency it's a routine failure i mean i mean it's just the use of emergency is problematic i think here. i mean it's interesting that for the first time in six months the word variance has come up um uh but I don't understand. Maybe you can explain why 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 you are providing us with this variance information and, and often late. 
Yeah, so we're so we're certainly working through the timing of the of submitting those emergency declarations to you, but we want to be as transparent as possible. So, for instance, when we know that somebody's are approaching or surpasses the the six hour mark, um, according to the BOC rule, we have to provide you with the reason why. And so then it requires some time for us to communicate with the facility and with our central movement unit to figure out what's the issue, um, and also to figure out what is the exact number of hours they have gone past. Because if there's an issue with the tracking system, we have to get feet on the ground. We have to look at Genetech to see exactly how long they've, you know, we need to know exactly how how long they've been in. Um, and so once we have that all information gathered for you, we submit the declaration um, so it's full and complete. I believe that, I'm, that our rules on variance say that if you if you are aware of a of a problem. Uh, which is a continuing problem, and you can't figure out how to solve it without a, a variance. You should ask for a variance. It's not an use of emergency variance. This is a variance request. Certainly, if we're two months in, and if you know, if we find that these challenges persist, we'll come to the board and engage in that conversation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, for you. <clears throat> Thanks. I had a, a couple um, follow-up questions on the record keeping. Um, you noted that you're looking to um, increase the utilization of the electronic tracking system about how well utilized is it now and how long do you think it's going to take you to get there? Just I think it you know, speaks to the um, prior back and forth about um, being able to really monitor, especially in real time, how long someone is there. Um, so, you know, when do you expect to be um, at 100 percent utilization? Yeah, it's a, good, it's a good question. Um, the tracking system is something that, right, like it, it's going to require staff training department wide. It doesn't just apply to the de escalation units, but we're certainly trying to leverage it for the de escalation units. Um, you know, this is going to be an ongoing staff training matter to ensure compliance with it. You know, if we if we find that it's really affecting our ability to track the de escalation units, then we'll have to come to the board and, you know, discuss some further path. Could we get the training schedule? Um, to see the timeline uh, on which you plan to train everyone? Sure, I'll speak with the academy. Okay. And then the other question had to do with supervision. Um, uh, we're noticing uh, inconsistent uh, rounding um, by officers um, to check on people who are in the de-escalation units, um, rounds that are supposed to happen every 15 minutes, sometimes only, you know, in really extreme cases, maybe one round over a course of several hours. Um, what is the department um, doing to ensure that, um, uh, first, are you tracking this too? What does your data show? How, m how much are officers rounding? And um, what, what are you doing to make sure that those 15-minute uh, rounds um, are happening. So yeah, if the board's aware of specific instances of lack of staffing and rounding, please bring that to our attention and we can certainly look into it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm unaware of any specific instance you might be referencing, um, but certainly staff, you know, if, if we are bringing individuals or even one individual to the unit, um, the expectation is staff are present on the unit throughout the entirety and conducting their rounds. Have you noticed any um, uh, inconsistencies with the 15 minute rounds or is the department's understanding um, or is your information showing that those are happening consistently every 15 minutes? I personally haven't have not been monitoring, but I know we have folks that are so we can I can certainly get back to you and let you know what you know our findings are. We can conduct, you know, a proper audit as well. If that's something that we find. Are you good. are you conducting or you're saying you could? I can I can certainly loop back with with the team that is monitoring. The units on Genetech can get back to you. I'm just not monitoring myself. Okay. Yeah, I think it's something we definitely have have found, and some sort of a you know consistent way to make sure that those rounds are happening, or to go in and and check that they have been, and you know address any uh, any issues. Uh, I think would make sense. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? I guess if you know something's going to be there for 20 hours, you might get them that first. If you, someone's going to be in there for a long time, as happens occasionally, you might get them a mattress. Certainly. Six hours. Thank you. Um, 
And I'll come to a public comment. Well, before we go there, I'd like to have one question. Yes. I'd like to ask the Department of Correction a couple of questions. Uh, who's here from programs? Nobody. Well, Commissioner, I'm going to ask you then. Our Deputy Commissioner of Programs is not um, here today. Um, it wasn't on the agenda, and um, she had another um, thing to attend. But happy to, if there are any questions regarding programs, happy to get back to you with the answers. Well, I just want to ask you, uh, I just don't want you to think that we're a crisis intervention group or people that go to, to your facilities to be critical about what goes on in your facilities. But we also like to hear good things. I understand. And one of the things that I was concerned about is that I know that in the beginning, uh, I asked about the summer youth employment program that you were conducting at Rikers Island with the youth. And and then they, they gave me a number and uh, I wanted to know how many of those young people uh, finished the program? How did they do? And was there any positive documentation in terms of what they learned? Or did they get noted for what they learned in that particular program? The other thing is that I want to share with you that I went shopping in one of those in uh, big uh, shopping centers. And I was standing behind two correction officers and I was just listening. And they were talking about how they were, they on their own bought some t-shirts for some of the young people that were in your custody. And how they, were, they had a basketball game against an outside community center or something. And, and one of the things that really broke my heart was that one correction officer said, you know something, after the game, our kids came over to him and one of them said, gee, now I gotta go back to jail. And that was during that time that they were playing that basketball game. They, they just didn't think about the fact that they were you know, in detention, but they were having a good time and they were sharing their experience with an outside group. But at the same time, this was two correction officers that gave of themselves and bought the t-shirts on their own without you guys you know, sponsoring it, okay? But there's no documentation on that. You know, I think that you should also, you know, you get a lot of negative publicity about everything that goes on in your department. But I don't see any good documentation, or you don't even invite us to some of those good programs that you have. You know, and I worked with youth all my life. And I like to see, you know, and I think I know a little bit about the Department of Correction, but I'd like to see some of the programs that go on there. And the other thing is that what my concern is your ministerial services, okay? Ministerial services used to be part of your emergency response and security in your department. And I know that, you know, a lot of those people that are in, in and I don't, I'd like to refer to them as those people, but some of the, the young men and women that are detained They'd like to see two people, their attorney and somebody that represents, okay? So the fact is that we don't hear about this. And the fact is that I want to see more of what you do with ministerial services because the fact is that I know that when we visited the Eric Taylor Center, one of our, the complaints was that they didn't have enough people who represented, you know, the uh, ministers that of what, that were of their denomination, see. So the, the, you know, the, there are certain things that we're also interested in that it's not just 
decontamination cells, et cetera, which are very important, by the way. There shouldn't be no problem you eliminating that damn door at that, at that, at that shower, okay? But the fact is that I'm, I'm also concerned about the, the types of programs that you have to, because I believe that the more tired they go to bed, the least time they have to think about hurting themselves or to hurt anybody else while they're in those detention cells or dorms or whatever it is that you want to call them. So that, that's the state I made. I made a couple of statements I, and, and I only asked one question, but I just wanted to, 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 you know, to share that experience with you, Commissioner. Thank you. And I appreciate your, um, your input and we will definitely personally invite you to our programs. I, I just wanted to give you an update on the, um, the summer youth program. Yes. Um, so the initiative went very well. We had 46 emergent adults at RNDC and 10 at RNSC that participated. Um, our summer employment will actually conclude on September 30th. Um, oh, you extended it? Yes. Oh, we okay. Have extended it. Okay. Um, so each of the emergent adults, they were scheduled to work three days a week, five, five hours each day. Um, for RNDC, we had 71 applicants and 46 were selected. And through July 18th through September 30th, they were paid $1.45 per day and they work five hours a day. And the jobs include sanitation, laundry, dining areas, library, work in the library, and also uh, distributing newspapers. Did they learn anything? Yes, and Did they continue to learn. I can have our deputy commissioner of, of programs give you a full on update. We can meet and talk about it, all the progress that we've seen throughout this, this, this initiative. We're actually having an initiative today um, at RNDC. We're having a baptism. So the deputy commissioner of, of programs, she's there. It's it's scheduled to start at noon. Can you? Can you can, I talked about programs. The chief jumped up immediately. He yeah, because we're, we're we're having that uh, we're having that event today, the baptism, and so the deputy commissioner of programs, that's where she is. It starts at noon today. So apologies for her not attending, but I just wanted you to know why she's here. Thank you, Felipe. Yeah, I'm. Um, um, um question i mean i my understanding was when the commissioner presented about summer youth employment that young people were going to be able to abide of summer youth employment uh through dycd like young people do in the community like they're doing probation or they're doing juvenile justice or child welfare um, with a different salary than just a few dollars an hour um why didn't the young people get connected to regular summer youth employment program run by the city like all other young people of the same age? So, Board Member Franco, I, I, you know, I'd have to, I'd like to sort of talk to you offline with okay. um, Francis Torres and we can talk through what occurred here. But um, I just want to note that this is ongoing and it's, it's occurring until the 30th of September. But happy to talk about the details okay. and provide you with a substantive update. Yeah, and when we do that, can can you also give us an update about school? Uh, I know it began last week, but I only saw fifteen students in the school. Okay. Um, and a big uh, desire by many other young people to be in school. Thank Absolutely. you. We'll schedule. We'll schedule something with you this week. Any other questions? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, we're now going to our public comment section. No more questions. Okay. Um, we will now turn to your public comments. Today we're going to hear from people in custody who want to participate in this meeting in their own words, who will play these statements first and then turn to regular public comment. And I just wanted to mention and emphasize we, we we announced the creation of these dedicated lines in English and Spanish at our July meeting. And I wanted to make sure that folks. Oh. 
I understand I I understand that the I understand that folks in the audience are very upset about the departure of most of the, the DC staff, but if we would do want to get to the comment period. Um, so if we could proceed, I just wanted to mention I just wanted to mention and emphasize actually that the comment line is um, available in English and in Spanish, and there is a, a message you hear right before you leave your comment that makes it very clear the purpose is to leave a comment that will be played publicly in this meeting and that there is nothing, um, nothing about it will remain private. Um, if the public comment also includes something that is a complaint, it will have been entered into our data manager system and I'm sorry. I, there, there is a time for public. There is a time for public comment. You know, after, once we get started, I I understand. If 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 the com if the comment that was left on the comment line consists of a complaint that's actionable by us, it will have been entered in our data manager and assigned to a staff member who who will have dealt with it as as a complaint as well. But at this point, we're moving to public comment period. The process is we will let people in custody speak first, people who are currently in custody and cannot be with us and left a message on these dedicated lines. Then we will uh, get to people who are here in the audience who have signed up to speak. And then third, we will get to the folks who are online who have signed up to speak. But Denise, if you could move um, to set up, if you could set up the recordings for us, if they're ready to play. Thank you. And Tanya, you're ready. Good morning, all. Um, we received a total of six comments from people currently in DLC custody. I will begin by playing them now. This is comment one. Good morning. I am an incarcerated person in Rikers Island, DCBC, and 2CB. Um, First off, I am being detained unlawfully and illegally. I seek to be released. Under these conditions where there's no law library on Sunday and Monday, I'm incarcerated 24-7 does not make sense. The information that I'm given in the law library is extremely old and cannot help me or my case. There are days where the coordinator is not there, which he needs to be. And that becomes a big problem. Because if I'm in here fighting my case, and I'm incarcerated 24-7, there should be a 24-7 public, excuse me, 24-7 law library. Um, there's no yellow envelopes. Um, there's no windows. The windows is not be cannot open. And uh, there's a problem or conflict, and there's pepper spray. You have to pull and door, door the to smell the pepper spray, pepper spray because there's no windows. The conditions that we are in are not humane. Most of the things that are done that are is quote unquote procedure doesn't make sense. And DOC, DOC, and the Supreme Court system all need to be you know, updated, revised on the laws of the new laws that Governor Kathy Hope will put in. And they need to be abide by. So Thank you. 
The caller has hung up. May I play in comment two? Morning, I'm at VCBC. Rebecca Zavin, we need Law Library 24-7, not five days a week and one day and one hour a day. We need Law Library 24-7. There are no windows in VCBC. We can't get fresh air. We need for their, your employees to stop mixing high class with low class education people. This is causes this causes riots and fights. The low class people, the low class education people, low on staff. We have no yellow envelopes, and we have no postal boxes for like three weeks. The information in our library is old and outdated. We need 2022 versions, not 2021, not 2020, 2012, 2016. The new laws been created and signed by uh, Governor Kathy Hoku April 9th, and we all need to be updated on these laws, even the judges. There's a lot of people, incarcerated people, not inmates, not prisoners, detainees are being held against their own will, unlawfully and illegally. So this has to go to Supreme Court as well to fix this problem. Thank you. The caller has hung up. Now I'm playing comment three. Hello. Um, I would like to remain anonymous. I just want to talk about the fact that I've been having major problems here on Ragged Island. Oh, first, no. Location for what's facility that they have uh, we locked as well. They turn off the water and no running water. I smell my own feces in my own urine. Also, they would not allow me to go to the to the doctor. They told the doctor that I refused. Also, um, they won't allow me to telephone for the okay. I stayed in that cell for 16 hours one time without any water. Two shifts, because sometimes they work double shifts. Anyway, um, I got transferred to the um, other building, which is called North um, Infirmary Command, NIC, because I'm in a wheelchair. At that building, I started having other major problems there. Um, I would jump, beat up, the officer watch, didn't do anything. The gangs run the jail, the officers allow how the gangs to run the jails. Anyway, that's all I have right now. God bless you. Please help. Have a nice day. Bye. Comment four. My name is Jason. Argentina, J A S O N A R T E N T I N A. My booking case is 141 2000 227. I just went on the record and I want the media to be alerted to a situation that I went through on Wednesday, April 15th. Officer. Badge number, he's from AMKC Field, Anna and Cross Center. On Wednesday, April 13th, Officer Young, Y-O-U-N-G. Badge number 14318. 14318. He told and recruited an inmate, Omar, O-M-A-R, Mboob, that's M as in Mary, O-O-B, to attack me. I didn't even realize this what was going on in the morning, I was about to take a shower. I was viciously beaten, received seven stitches, bloody mess, and it took seven hours noon for me to get a stitch out of the facility from AMKC on Rikers Island. He 
still see inexplicably kept this officer around me even after that situation. About 10 311 complaints prior to that situation and probably 10 complaints afterwards. And they were extremely negligent. I'm in jail awaiting trial and I'm being treated like some type of criminal, which I will be completely exonerated. But that's a whole other case. This officer should be held detained on conspiracy charges because what he did was a criminal act. And it was even more despicable because he's an officer, supposedly held to a higher standard. So hopefully I can get some feedback. I am now on the boat in the Bronx, DC, DC, and likely will be in jail until January, which would make 36 months total. Thank you. This officer should be terminated immediately. The caller has hung up. Now playing comment five, the last Angus comment. Hello, this is Ronald Jordan. Um, okay, case number one four one two two zero two three four one. And I have several complaints. For one, when I came here on July thirty first, I was abused by the officers. Okay. I was in a part of Ragged Island Call facility and the officers um locked me in my cell, wouldn't give me water for like 16 hours or they wouldn't have me. I didn't have a telephone call the whole time I was there for a half a month. I was there from um, from July 31st to August 17th. I never had a phone, okay? Didn't have a sheet or, or a blanket, okay? Didn't have running water. I had to smell my own feces and uh, urine. Okay, so I was totally abused. I told my lawyer about it, okay? And he told me he'll give me a civil lawyer. Well, I'm complaining, I'm covering my uh, self because I had been abuses. I had no answers from the abuses. Also, mail was sent out and my, my family never received the mail. Okay, the grievances I put up, I never had the answer of the grievances. It's been a living hell here. And I got transferred to the next dorm of the general population to NIC, um, that's abbreviated for North uh, Infirmary Command. Okay, I was jump, I was beat up, I was punched in my face. Okay, the guy tried to stop me from my canteen, my concert. The officer watched, the officer didn't do nothing. Okay, um, I have the officer's name and badge number. Okay, I don't have it on me right now. Um, I should have brought it with me to the phone. Anyway, it's been a living hell. Okay, and I have a few more complaints, but anyway, that's enough for now. Just in God bless you. And have a great day. Bye. The next comment is in Spanish, which will be followed by English translation. I'm in the four months la correccional del voto. Esto aquí siento los servicios. Bien. La única parte es que el control de pena aquí está a mano de los reclusos. ¿Entiendes? No es posible que aquí haya cuatro teléfonos y solamente uno puede usar tres, uno solo, y los tres son de la ganga. Tenemos para hacer si tres horas, puede ya hacer una llamadita. Mientras tanto, los dos teléfonos están sin usar porque yo da su gana, ¿me entiendes? Y así como muchos servicios, como el servicio de pantry, aquí están muchas frutas, muchas cosas, y ellos dan lo que quieren. Entonces, los oficiales aquí, todo el mundo ve lo que está pasando, ¿me entiendes? Y no hacen nada. Incluso si una persona mayor viene aquí en segunda o incluso, ¿me entiendes? Y uno tiene miedo de eso, que uno tiene que hacer lo que yo quiera, ¿me entiendes? Porque de su gana, uno tiene que hacer. Porque aquí hay cámaras y se ve todo. Entonces uno está mano aquí. Eh, todas estas personas me entienden que están por muerte, por lo que sea. Y uno cometió un error, ¿me entiendes? Y viene aquí y cae en esta parte aquí. Aunque uno no sea de este ambiente, ¿me entiendes? Pero ya por ejemplo, cometió está aquí. Se cuenta con una pandilla aquí de ganga. 
que te ponían a hacer cosas que tú no quieras, ¿me entiendes? Y todo se vigila, lo controlan aquí adentro. Se, se puede arreglar. Si le quitarían el, el poder a, a las gangas y también a las personas mayores que la pongan a un sitio aparte, porque aquí estos jovencitos hacen con ellos lo que quieren y se burlan de todo, ¿me entienden? Pero por otra parte, el servicio de salud es muy bueno aquí, también puede decir cosas buenas. A uno lo atienden muy bien en todos los sentidos, solamente que quiere puede cambiar es que le quiten en poder a los de la ganga para que esto aquí sea mejor y que los oficiales a veces son cómplices de todo, ¿me entienden? De todo el tráfico, de todo el abuso, de todo lo que hay aquí, ¿me entienden? Nadie dice nada, porque el sistema que está bien no fuera en control de la ganga. Eso era todo. La persona que llamó a Colgado. That concludes the comment. Now we have English translation, please. Judith? Judith. Uh, yeah, I'm here. I was waiting to read the transcript. Is that what I was asked to do? Or you're asking me to translate what he said? Uh, yes, please read the transcript. Okay. Get ready. I'm waiting. Uh, Judith, please read what you prepared for us uh, through the translation that you did. That was not the instructions I received. I apologize. What? <laughs> I understand through what I did not apologize, but I was told that I will be reading someone that will be given to me. However, the trans the gentleman was explaining that in this facility, there are gang members and there are, he said, how is it possible that there are phones, four phones, and yet we cannot use them because the younger members, the gang members are abusing the phone system. And he said the facility is a good facility, but there are too many abuses when it comes to the older inmates. And so it seemed to him that a lot of the officers are in cahoots with these gang members and they're also, you know, they're ignoring the abuses when they get the complaints from them. So these members, they would like some help with controlling the younger ones that are abusing the system. He mentions that the food is good, the service is good. There are many good things in this place. However, because of the abuses, in that area that we cannot access the phones, we cannot move around and we're afraid of speaking up. This is one of the reasons is that many of us are here and we're afraid because we do not know what we, how we could get hurt if any one of these gang members, younger ones will hurt us. So this is why we're asking that this matter will be looked into because we are addressed it with the officers and nothing has been done. Thank you. I can't hear you, Amanda. Oh, sorry. Apologies. I just wanted to make one comment, um, mostly for the for the public's benefit. My understanding is there was a complete verbatim translation from Spanish to English completed for this man. Um, and I've, I've seen it. I thought the way he worded um, his comments was quite, excuse me, was quite poignant. Um, and in the future, I, I think it's really important that we have exact translation. I appreciate your summary, but to honor his words, I think exact translation is very important. And, and in the future, we'll make sure we provide that. 
It's going to be difficult. Exact translations. So thank you all for the public comments. I'm going to thank you. Last people and trustee, I'm going to speak this from the side of the trustee. I'm going to call you person Zane, and I'm calling you up to the, to the podium. Our first person is uh, Dr. Francis, and I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time making out the handwriting. It looks like um, it helps. It helps. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Hi. Thank you uh, for having me. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Francis Catellis, and I'm a clinical psychologist. Uh, and I'm a member of the Hold Solitary Campaign, as well as the Jails Action Coalition. I guess my, mostly I wanted to comment about the report and to thank you for a report that gave a powerful uh, image of what's going on here. Uh, I also want to thank you, by the way, for some of the tough questions that were asked today, because that is not something I've seen at, uh, so much at the meetings I've attended here over the past couple of years. So it shows a level of interest on your part um, and is different from what I'm going to uh, say about the report. One of the things I found very disturbing in your report is that the recommendations Instead of the, the recommendations all seem to be about little managerial issues rather than a real attempt to change the environment in the uh, uh, jails, which is so poisonous. Uh, that is not addressed in your, um, in, in your recommendations. Uh, one of the issues for me is, I mean, since it's so clear that so many of the people who are in the jails are severely mentally ill, uh, or you have many women who we know have had serious traumatic experiences as women, I don't get a feeling for what has really been being done to address those issues. And it seems to me we can't address the issues in your jail uh, because you're not doing anything that is meaningful to help them to change their behavior and to help them to move on. Um, it, it's interesting because this is the first time I heard about the program uh, surrounding uh, both playing the game outside, uh, involvement in sports, and also some of your questions about employment activities. I must say one question I had about that was uh, if someone is working in the uh, laundry, how is that helping them prepare for a job on the outside? Are you really addressing what people need? And it seems to me that that's not what is happening. So you asked some good, tough questions, and I would like to see some good, tough answers. And so far, I don't see that. And unless you can help people to change their behavior. Um, I must say, at one time, I remember one of the hearings, and I think it was during these times when everything was virtual, uh, one of the corrections officers who we testified who was commenting said something like, we're not social. Well, no, they're not. But who, why the hell does somebody need an advanced college degree to learn to talk to somebody, to learn to engage with somebody, to learn to just be a decent human being who is talking to another potential and decent human beings. Uh, lots of them. Because we could hear from the comments they make that the humanity does come out. And so you need them both to behave in ways that are much more engaging than what you have got now. So 
please, uh, thank you for trying, and but you got to do much more. Not just we got to change the phone system, or not just we got to have a better reporting system, but really we have to change the culture of the jails. Thank you. Thank you. Um, ask one question or make one request, and that is, I miss almost everything that was said today from you, from everybody. The hearing system here is terrible. And I would hope that, I mean, there may have been good things that I missed, who knows, but I, I can hardly hear most of this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, am I on? Thank you. Our next person is uh, Chaplain Phillips. I'm Chaplain Dr. Victoria Phillips. Everyone welcome back to me or Miss B. There's a few things I wanted to address with me today. First and foremost, I want to state on the record that Mervyn is no action. And uh, one of the board members today mentioned technology being used to stop suicide. And technology has already been used. Technology showed us seven years ago that officers lack humanity when we looked at Cleef Brown. Uh, technology showed us in 2019 that officers lack humanity when they laughed at Lane Technology showed us just what a week or two ago that not one officer, but two officers and a captain lacked humanity when they allowed an individual to bleed out. And last week at a press conference at a rally outside of City Hall, while in the midst of emceeing, um, I was actually handed a phone that had a private a Facebook group, and I read from the record in real time officers' responses to the last, the 13th death in DOC's custody, and they were saying, oh, so he should have split his wrist as well. It would have made him bleed out longer. One officer put in the Facebook chat, this is a group of officers. One officer said they should have took a still pic to pick last night over the video. Like we, this is the mindset. And I brought that up for a reason. Because we have a, fe a former federal officer right now as commissioner. And no, we cannot put it all on this man to make every single officer come back to work and do what they're supposed to do. And I want to straight away and just last week I was speaking to a couple of captains who was telling me, Dr. V, you know, it's not even about the staff not showing up, it's about the staff who do show up. And one captain was saying, I have an officer, I know it's horrible at work, but he's still a body that I have to use on that tour. And so right now we're in the midst of of begging for minimum standards. We're in the midst of begging for humanity, but we're not even addressing poor behavior officers. We're not even we're not even addressing uh, a supervisor having the ability to say, no, you go home or I'm gonna write you up because you're not worthy to be here and help DOC in the capacity. Care custody control. What does that really mean? You know, when we say that, that means that CHS should be allowed to go after their patient, tend to a patient. But we already know, and I've been in front of you all, only you haven't been here for the last decade, but I've been in front of this board for the last decade telling you the very things your report shown, the very things the monitor report has said, and you do not listen. I've directly said officers have threatened me. I've directly said officers are part of gang members. I've even told a board member when drugs was coming in through the kitchen, and it was not even followed up on. So you all have a duty to save lives. You, every last one of you, and I just want to say, it's not a board member that's been a part of this board yet that someone hasn't died. Maybe you, I don't know your thing with the numbers. You're very good with the numbers. I'm sorry, if I'm, I don't mean disrespect, but maybe you, I don't know when you just joined. But all of you have been around and someone has died from the watch. 
Where's your conscience? You also be sleeping in Christ along with the mayor and the commissioner. And the commissioner, he he told he gave you, he told you Bill Brick for no straw today. He sent you an FTC who knows nothing. He sent you a chief who couldn't give you a correct answer. And they two-step around things because this is what they do. Now your meetings happen every month. Except for August and December. This is what I teach the community. But you mean tell me DOC plan a graduation this year for a BOC hearing, a baptism this year on a BOC hearing? That's by design. The same way you went to visit a facility and the officer you used to work with or train was, was taking you on tour, that was by design. You have to take the step and actually step into leadership as the oversight board. You can't hide behind DOC is not giving you data. DOC is not listening to you as an excuse anymore because people die when they watch. You all should be up for blocking city hall rings in hell to get the council members to help move things that you can't move along, to get the mayor on board to move things that you can't move along. You have no excuses no more. 30 years. 40 years, it's all amazing. The last 10 years I've been having 20 years work on my was open on in nursing, CBT, cognitive behavior therapy. The clarity that they do have there, I love email him out. Many people may have made a law be pleased with him. He did so much work on the officer. And it's for the detainees. And I'm one of those people who work for them. Officers reach out to me. No, but he told them, told the warden, stop calling out to me. Why would you tell your boys to stop calling the clergy that they know they could trust? That they know is going to follow up whether it's on the officer side or the detainee uh, side. I told this board this year that I told DOC to bring back the suicide prevention task force. Now, I'm a, I'm a coach here of the New York State Department of Correction Young Adult Task Force. I've never been a part of the suicide prevention, but I check on it because it's important to me, because they're my community members, because over half the population has a mental health concern. And I do work for the last eight years for the Mental Health Project Urban Justice Center and over half of And I say it's because these are the things that they got followed up. A month and a half later, Mr. Carter died. How many systems fell to from the hospital to the shelter to the home to DOC to CHS? All fell to him. There still was no suicide prevention task force brought back. How many people have died since then? How many people have died in special units this year? And they tell you they don't have staff. The five o'clock incident, they gave an excuse. Staff was what training on um, coming in, going out in the hospital. If someone died and that was an excuse, the nursing department would give, we'd be lying. We be lying. Murder is no accident. And if you're in care, custody, and control, that means your life, your heartbeat is at the mercy of the officer on tour. That means it's all of your responsibilities to make sure they're doing their job, they're following protocols, and they're upholding minimum standards. You have to do better. You have to do better. And whether there's a suicide aid or watch or not, DOC and CHS is responsible for that life. Bottom line, no excuse. Too many people have died. Officers, the culture has not changed. What are we doing here? You allow people to get up and walk out. They didn't even have their hands. They complained. The beat up. Who played the book? They came to all the years. I have played uh, testimonies from people detained. You have never heard me play a book. In case number on the record, I tell you, if you want to know who this person is directly, I'll give you the information off the record. You literally can't protect people right now, but you put that person's name, the book, and case number, and the issue for them to be beat down before you even show up. Do you even go to the facility that you that you get these calls from? You're putting their life in jeopardy. Now I bet for them to have their voice on the record, but not for them to be beat down and 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 and, and discarded because you're not doing your job and you're failing in leadership at this. You can't keep my community safe. You can't. You're not there. You're not there. And FTC, she told FTC that you want to ask questions that DC tourists would be a there was a reason she was not. Are they telling me the time the the uh, yesterday? I brought that up on the record years, years now. That 
they know the meetings happen, but they always start stuff that you want to ask them about. Oh, we begin that yesterday. We begin that yesterday. Follow up. Sleep. Get your sleep in bed. Follow diapers. Please. My people even need you. And you we have to expand that as well. It can't just be people who are unrelatable that, that you think that the population is going to speak to and bond with. So thank you for raising that. Please save lives. Lives in real time. You got to get it together. Politics, put it to the side because you go to sleep at night, you need to understand. You are responsible. You got to let people You are powerful. It does not matter where you came from, what you're doing. Who are responsible in this? What are your family and your family speak about you when they talk about corrections and you being a part of BOC? Peace and bless. Stay blessed. Our next speaker is Leah Faria. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Leah Faria, and I am the senior community organizer with the Women's Community Justice Association. And we lead the Beyond, hashtag Beyond Rosie's campaign, advocating for the women and the gender expansive population at the Rosenstinger Center for Rikers Island. The first pillar of our campaign is to concentrate these mothers daughters, and sisters who are particularly vulnerable in jail. I was detained at Rosie's for nearly three years, starting in 1997. I was only 23 years old, a single mom who was suffering from trauma of an abusive relationship. Now, I visit regularly in my role with WCJA, and the stories of the women are still all too familiar they're just like mine. The women and the gender expansive population at Rosie's are from black and brown communities with the fewest resources. Many are domestic violence victims and most are mothers and caregivers. In June, WCJA released a report with the Lipman Commission called Path to Under 100 that showed who was at Rosie's. Some of the findings were that Harlem, East New York, Brownsville, and Brooklyn and South Bronx had the highest admissions to Rosie's over the past five years. 82% of women had mental health diagnosis, compared to 49% of the men at Rikers. Up to 93% had experienced physical, sexual, and or emotional violence. 70% were parents, compared to 40% of men and most had children under the age of 18. Most had rosies for a short amount of time. The medium length of stay was only 13 days. One third were there because they couldn't afford $5,000 or less of bail. 22% were rosies on nonviolent charges, mostly related to drugs and property crime. Women, and gender expensive people are particularly vulnerable in jail. The death of Mary Yehuda this May was a tragedy and never should have happened. There must be a focus on incarceration and safely releasing as many with community based support. Right now, there are 307 women and gender expensive people at Rosie's. The city's plan to close Rikers aims for 100, and the path to under 100 report is a plan to get the population even lower. New York City can get there. At the height of COVID, the city decreased the number at Rosie's to 149. At that time, the Board of Corrections issued a call for decarceration, and there is still a major health crisis. The Path to Under 100 report is a roadmap that outlines how to reduce the number 
of those detained at Rotis by at least 70%. The strategies include investing in gender responsive community resources and diversion programs that meet the specific needs of women and gender expansive people. Shiro is an example of a transitional housing program that has diverted over 300 from Rosie's in the past five years, with only two rearrests at the fraction of the cost of keeping someone in jail. Conduct a holistic needs assessment early on that identify domestic violence, housing, mental health, caregiver status, and other factors that should be used in decisions throughout the case and to connect those at Rotis with resources. Establish a population review team that brings together stakeholders to review every individual case at Rosie's and facilitate non-jail alternatives. Provide accessible, current information on the demographics and resources available for those at Rosie's, including a citywide women's resource navigator. The Board of Corrections can make a difference in decarceration and the women and gender expansive people at Rosie should be a priority. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Salma Simmons. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for the opportunity to voice my opinion and my thoughts. My name is Bakumara Simmons. Um, I live in Brooklyn. I am the mother of Athena, who is currently housed at Rosie's Best Data Center. She has been there for over three years. Me and her have to be here. Before she went to Rosie's, she's never gotten in trouble in her life. She's never been arrested. She was working with the same children. She had been a bad environment. She needed to go to start college. Um, Mia ended up at Rosie's defending herself after she was attacked and suddenly. Um, I work with her, Mia Stacey at Rosie's every day. Mia has been jumped while I was on the phone with her. Um, she tells me the girls are now getting cut. Everyone has weapons and Rosie's and nothing is being done. Um, after Mary Ayuda died, it shook the women. They're not getting medical attention. They're missing medical appointments because now when they go out to go onto the bridge, the doors are being opened for other inmates to come from other units to cut and fight them. So they're scared to go to medication. My daughter hasn't been to physical therapy in over three years. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just emotional. Please forgive me. Um, there are not enough sanitary napkins. When they ask for things, officers make fun of them. An officer has told my daughter, you're never leaving. Why don't you just kill yourself? Mm. My daughter just turned 24. She's been here since she was 19 years old. Um, it is it, to go there to see her, it is physically, mentally exhausting. Mothers and daughters who are Rosie's have their loved ones there have been forgotten in the stories about writers. They deserve safety, dignity, and respect. On August 25th was Mia's birthday. I cannot believe another year has passed. She's still been in Rosie. She should not be there. A judge has promised her on three different occasions to release her, to give her an ATI, even a bracelet, then she was again, she was again denied, even though there is a spot for her. Um, it has never happened. She was in a community program where she could move ahead with her education. This year she was valedictorian in Rosie's. She was given a four-year scholarship to John Jay College, and I want to see her thrive in this new opportunity. But instead of Mia's, Mia's moving forward, her spirit is broken. She's afraid for her life at Rosie's because 
She has asthma, and she has asthma attack. It takes minutes and hours for them to come and get her. So, you know, she's afraid. It doesn't take any justice for her or any of the ladies that are at Rosie. I asked for help to release women like me who deserve care and support and to be treated humanely. For those who need higher level of care and security, Lincoln is a better alternative for the women in the city's jail. The, instead of the plan to move them to Kew Garden, um, please do the right thing and keep my daughter and the other women safe and close it up. I'm asking by saying to please, excuse me, and close in. I like to begin by saying thank you again for letting me share my voice. As a mom, I'm pleading for the lives of my daughter and the other ladies at Rosie. Thank you and God bless you all. Slide it across. Across. Marquise Jenkins. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Kelly Young. I am the Civil Rights Campaign Coordinator at Vocal New York. Um, Vocal, along with Freedom Agenda, Halt Solitary, Jails Action Coalition, Visionary V, and Women's Community Justice Association, joined together ahead of the Board of Corrections hearing this morning to demand decarceration. We know, because we've experienced it, that anyone sent to Rikers Island is subjected to the potential of the death penalty. So in support of our organization's long-term goal of ending pretrial detention, we are requesting that the Board of Correction adopt the following demands as part of its recommendations to address the crisis on Rikers Island. One, issue an official call for decarceration. Include a demand to release all people and stop sending people to these deadly jails. Two, with the ultimate goal of releasing everyone from Rikers, call for the immediate release of the following categories of people. Pregnant people, all women, all transgender people, all gender non-conforming people, people with mental health needs, people with chronic health problems, people with city sentences. Three, require an actionable commitment to harm reduction. Release all people with substance use needs. Demand transparency on the training of correction staff on the carrying and administering of Narcan. Ensure that staff with mental health training are placed in union with those with mental health complexities. Provide individual first aid kits that include fentanyl test strips to everyone detained in a way that eliminates any possibility of retaliation or further violence. Reconvene the suicide prevention task force. Complete suicide prevention trainings for staff and expand the use of suicide prevention aids. Four, in the use of solitary confinement. So the passage of Intro 49, a bill to end the barbaric solitary confinement in New York City jails. Five, order Mayor Eric Adams to close the pipeline that feeds Rikers, as he puts it, no later than November 1st. This plan should adopt recommendations laid out by the Commission on Community Reinvestments and the Closure of Rikers Island in their 2021 report that addresses the root causes and drivers of criminalized behavior. Six, require the city to create and sustain a pathway for stability for those living DOC facilities. This includes halting the plans to close the city's six re-entry hotels. The hotel contributed to lower recidivism rates and public safety. Closing them will only strengthen the pipeline to Rikers that Mayor Adams claims to want to close. Also support the passage of the Fair Chance Housing Act, a bill to end housing discrimination for people with criminal records. Then 
address gender harm on Rikers, establish accountability metrics for the implementation of the Prison Rape Elimination Act that includes women, trans, and gender expansive people. Thank you. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak. My name is Eileen Long, I'm a woman incarcerated and a survivor of Rosie's at Rikers Island. I'm a civil rights union leader with Vocal New York, as well as a social worker, community activist. I spent over 420 days on that godforsaken landfill before unnecessarily taking a plea and drafting a state. One of the main reasons I felt compelled to do this was, as it continues to be, dangerous, neglectful, corrupt, and torturous environment that thrives so abundantly on the island and its borough support jails. I would love to say things have improved since I left the island, that New York has begun to remedy some of their wrongs within the Department of Corrections. However, just the opposite has occurred. Oh, and by the way, the drug and other paraphernalia enter the facility not by mail, not by visits or packages, but by the corrections officers transporting them in. Anyway, despite systemic changes, albeit slow and small, in local and state laws and policies, Rikers has instead turned from a tribe to a death island. Over the past nine months, 13 people murdered while in the care and custody of the New York City Department of Corrections. All but one of the individuals were not convicted of a crime. They were simply detainees. Not one of the human beings who perished had received a court-mandated death warrant. New York does not have a death penalty statute, or so I thought. The most recent death that occurred, Mr. Nieves. Three, not one, not two, but three officers sat and watched as this man slit his own throat and bled out. They watched rather than notify a medical professional or even push the pin on their utility belt, notifying the compound of an emergency. They had three pins among them to choose from. However, then, however rather than save the life of a fellow human being, they chose to watch and allow him to die like it was a spectator sport or something. When I was a detainee, and from what I've been told by other detainees since, the officers would encourage them detainees who are experiencing suicidal ideations to quote unquote, go through with it, saying things like hurry up and do it, need a rope or just hang it up already and kill yourself. This is exhausting. Every couple of weeks we are here, my fellow activist comrades and I speaking out about yet another preventable death of one of my sisters and brothers that occurred while, DNC, while on DLC watch. When will it end? Individuals who are detained on the island are not getting medication and medical appointments. Corrections officers and DOC staff continue to violate the Taylor laws and absent themselves from upwards of two or more shifts in a row. As a result, detainees are locked in their cells for sometimes 10 to 20 hours in a row, sometimes even more. They are not only not being provided their meals, but medications are not being provided, especially for those with chronic illnesses such as diabetes, mental illnesses, sickle cell and other anemias, cancer, and medically assisted substance abuse treatment, and plus a myriad of other illnesses. And the women are not receiving products to use during their menstruation. Toilets and sinks are breaking down beyond repair. Human beings are forced to go to the bathroom in plastic bags and drink water out of the toilet bowl. Blankets? Ha! Some detainees do not even have a mattress, never mind sheets or blankets. When officers do bother to come in and work their shift, they are usually only there to traffic in weapons, alcohol, and fentanyl-invested narcotics. Oh, and of course, instigate and engage detainees in physical altercations or sexually assault and rape the detainees. And rather than attempt to fix these egregious human rights violations and save lives and heal, the DOC and Mayor Adams are doubling down on the mistreatment and abuse and demanding 
that despite it being illegal as per New York state law, solitary confinement continue to be utilized. Solitary confinement has been medically determined to be torture and permanently damage to a person's mental health. It's almost like they want to torture and murder people. Maybe they do. Clearly, the DOC in New York City have proven that they are beyond incapable of operating and maintaining any kind of order and organization within their facilities. It goes without saying that they do not value human life and instead would prefer car and tools so that they can continue to legally murder human beings entrusted to their care and custody. They need to be removed entirely from any and all operations. The law to close Rikers Island passed years ago at this point. What needs to happen is that closure, mu closure must be expedited. It can begin with moving from Rosie's had. Terminate the employee employment of the entire day. Replace it with properly trained, educated healers. with the message of improve mental and physical health services. Improve education programs, infusion uh, of domestic violence services and programs, alternatives to incarceration, and of course, violence interrupters. Rather than selling ill equipped and barely trained police officers on mental health, calls, send trained and properly vetted mental health professionals to intervene and begin the healing process. We can't have one more person die. Please stop the utter disrespect human life and uh, within and around the New York City Department of Corrections. All of our lives are depending upon it. Thank you again for allowing me to speak. Um, so we now go into a web version. Um, so for those who don't know, very specific to see the web platform and you hit your hand, please raise your hand at hand.com below the participants list on the web if you don't see the participants list, click on the silhouette of the person on the menu at the bottom of the screen. Once you open the participants list, you will see hand.com to raise your hand. When you raise your hand, we will unmute you and you can turn on the screen. You can then repeat your public. I will not call our first speaker, uh, Fleming Smith in the Urban Justice Center. Fleming, please go ahead and unmute yourself. Yes, can you hear me? Hi, thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Fleming Smith, and my colleague Samantha Colson will be speaking after me. We are legal interns with the Urban Justice Center's Mental Health Project, and we're here to share a testimony from a person incarcerated on Rikers Island. It includes discussions of self-harm. I was in solitary in GVRC for three months this winter. I did 30 days in solitary and a little over two months in enhanced special housing. But ESH, to be honest with you, is the same thing as the box. It's mentally draining. It's physical torture. I wasn't allowed outside my cell. Sometimes we get showers, some days we don't. The only time I was let out of my cell was for the shower or for recreation, and they barely called rec. I remember there was a time where I went two months without having any rec, just because the officers would say that they were short on staff, or they would take a list for rec at six o'clock in the morning when nobody is up. A lot of the times the officers don't want to do their job. They'll just do around so that the camera can see them. But rec is mandatory and everyone is supposed to be entitled to one hour of rec a day. Even in AMKC, I'm out of ESH and I'm out of the box, but they don't even call rec every day here. The last time I had rec was a week ago. Staffing is the main excuse. They say we're short on staff, especially when I was in the box. They always said they were short on staff. I was in a cell where the windows didn't open and it was constantly hot. I was there in the winter, so it was cold and they had the heater running. 
but my window didn't open and the heat was blasting so hot that I couldn't wear clothes in my cell. At night, I sweated myself to sleep. It would be so hot that I couldn't sleep. I would complain, but no one would say that they could do anything. They tried to see if they could put me in a cell where the window opened, but the box was always full. My time in the box started after I was blamed for something someone else did. I and one other person went to the box for it even though other people were involved. Our tickets were written by the same officer, but they said different things. Mine said that I alone did it, and his ticket said that he alone did it. I told the hearing officer about the tickets, but they found me guilty. I appealed that over five months ago, but I haven't heard anything from anybody. No one answered my appeal. They put me in ESH after I did 30 days in the box. I was supposed to have an ESH hearing to explain why they put me there, but I never had a hearing. ES ESH is no different from the box because you don't get out of your cell at all. I was in ESH for over 60 days. In total, I did almost 100 days confined to a cell. The captain said the reason I didn't have a hearing was because my house was asymptomatic for COVID-19, but they never did any adjournment. They just never gave me a hearing. I'll now pass it to my colleague, Samantha Colson, to continue the testimony. Two months after the incident, I was just given a disposition that I was guilty, but I'd never been to a hearing. I appealed, but haven't heard anything back from that. How do you find me guilty if you never gave me a hearing? I grieved both dispositions, but never heard anything back. On Rikers Island, they're saying the most time you can be put in the box is 30 days. But what they're actually doing is putting people in ESH, making you do more time confined. So you're going to do the max of 30 days, but they're going to put you in ESH and you could be in ESH for months. My mental health was affected by not being able to leave my cell, being cramped in small quarters for weeks at a time. I have had a bad history where I try to not indulge myself in hurting myself, but I did before. I've cut my wrist before and I've, I've had episodes where I really tried to hurt myself badly. I try to always talk to people and I take my medication. I've been diagnosed with anxiety, PTSD, and depression. AMKC is much better than the box or ESH because I actually see mental health professionals here. When I was in solitary in ESH, I didn't see anybody. Nobody came to see me. I always thought that mental health would come check on me and all the other people here, but they didn't come to see me at all. In AMKC, I go to see them every three weeks. Some days they call medication late. They don't have a set time where they can get to all of the houses. Just last week, they didn't call my house's medication at all. At least once a week, something like this happens where I don't get my medication. We all know about so many people who killed themselves on Rikers last year. A lot of those deaths were people going through something mentally where they felt like they weren't getting the help that they needed. I think if they were getting the help that they needed, a lot of these deaths would not have happened. Rikers is a horror. People aren't getting the bare basic necessities that they need. In the box, there's people going days without showering. It's hard for people to use the phone. Guys aren't getting the wreck they're entitled to. People don't even want to come to visit here to go visit a person. That puts a person yeah, in a messed up space. <laughs> Okay. It's our end. I apologize for the technical problem we've been having today in our first uh, hybrid meeting. Um, I understand that, that um, some of the feeds have been choppy um, or some of the camera work has been a little blurry. Um, certainly not intentional. We're doing the best we can with this first try back to life. Please keep going if you think it might get better. Um, Rikers is a horror. People aren't getting the bare basic necessities that they need. In the box, there's people going days without showering. It's hard for people to use the phone. Guys aren't getting the rec they're entitled to. People don't even want to come here to visit a person. That puts a person in a messed up space when your loved one doesn't even want to come see you because they will be treated like an inmate just because they want to come visit you. I know they're talking about shutting it down and I really hope it happens. I just pray that I can make it home safely because I know that this can be very traumatic on anybody. It is sad that people lost their lives by coming here, but it just goes to show that Rikers Island should be shut down. This ends the testimony. Thank you for listening. 
Thank you. Um, Jonathan Cortez. Hi. Uh, good afternoon. Um, so my name is John Cortez. I'm with the New York Reentry Education. I would like to call attention to a very worrisome uh, agreement that is looming with the Department of Corrections and Securus, aka the owner of JP. So Securus is the primary provider of telecommunications in uh, prisons across the country. They have a 70% market share, probably larger than that. That's uh, according to 2014 data. Recently, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau took action against JPay for violating the Consumer Financial Protection Act, as well as the Electronic Fund Transfer Act. Some of their findings are that JPay abused its market dominance, they charged fees without authorization, and they misrepresented fees to consumers. More specifically, with respect to the acts that were violated, they violated the Consumer Financial Protection Act by charging consumers fees to access their own money on prepaid debit cards that consumers were forced to use. They violated the Electronic Fund Transfer Act when it required consumers to sign up for a JPay debit card as a condition of receiving government benefits, in particular gate money, which is money provided under state law to help people meet their essential needs as they are released from incarceration. So these are some of the uh, commonly documented uh, predatory practices that JPay engages in. Um, what is JPay? They're uh, tablets that provide telecoms as well as uh, other resources, both uh, entertainment and education related. Uh, currently, the department is under uh, talks, negotiations with Securus to introduce JPay tablets into the facility. And this, should this happen, uh, the, the users will be charged exorbitant fees for every use case as well as their families. Um, more specifically, uh, to send an email, you have to attach stamps. Stamps come at a cost. Uh, phone calls could cost, uh, famously, someone got, uh, several people got charged $25 for a 15 minute phone call. Uh, now they're saying, you know, they're charging much less, $55 to listen to a single album. Um, one of, when, when Securus was contracting with uh, prisons in uh, across the nation, uh, they wrote in the contract that a clause would be to eliminate in-person visitation. Uh, this actually happened in New York City when uh, Securus was uh, contracting uh, with the Department of Correction, but doing so through a multi-state uh, agreement where it wouldn't have to go in front of the board or there wouldn't have to be a hearing or anything on it. Um, City Council passed a law that required video visitation to be free of charge, and that basically uh, did away with the uh, agreement. Earlier in this meeting, one of the uh, board members uh, was talking about the importance of programming, particularly programming for youth. And of course, a hallmark of programming is education. The really concerning dynamic here with the prospective introduction of JPay tablets is the potential for them to extract Pell Grant dollars from students uh, using online providers of higher education, such as Ashland University, who they uh, work, have been working with for a number of years. Uh, in fact, their learning management system, Lantern, was created in conjunction with one of the higher ups at Ashland University, and that is the learning management system that they currently use um, and that they encourage uh, higher education prison programs to charge students anywhere from $100 per student to $250 per student. So right now we're moving from uh, a place where education is provided free of charge to the incarcerated, uh, including on the 
uh, loaded uh, education loaded technology that was in place to uh, a state where education is going to be less accessible and it's going to be accessible at a cost to the incarcerated and potentially their families. Uh, moreover, there's the threat of um, you know, effectively cutting off uh, providers that are local based, uh, making access more difficult. These uh, higher institutions of higher education, these institutions of higher education. So, okay. I'm sorry. So you exceeded the time limit, but if you could just finish up. Okay, yeah. The institutions of higher education like. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Okay. Um, again, if, if you see the timeline, I'm sure that you're in your entirety of your time given to us in paper so we can make sure it's on the website or by email. Um, and the next speaker is Julia Solomon. Go ahead and take yourself off of me. Yes, can you all hear me? Hi, uh, my name is Julia Solomons. I'm testifying on behalf of the Bronx Defenders Prisoners' Rights Project. Um, just to note, on average, since the beginning of 2022, we have seen 14 days elapse between every death on Rikers Island. We've witnessed a preventable death under DOC custody almost every month of this year to date. If this pattern continues to hold for the remaining months, we're on a tragic path to surpassing the number of in-custody deaths in 2021. Um, mental health crises are unsurprisingly spiking in the jails right now, and the response that we have seen from Correctional Health Services and DOC is unacceptable. After Michael Nieves' death, correctional officers were overheard complaining that it's not their fault if someone wants to commit suicide and lamenting the disciplinary action that those officers received. Uh, we at Bronx Defenders are having to elevate almost every single complaint in order for clients to get the care that they need. And even then, it is often a game of correctional health services and DOC pointing fingers at each other instead of taking responsibility and acknowledging that there's a problem. Um, in one example, Bronx Defenders client calling M had requested suicide watch and the request was acknowledged, but days and then weeks passed by and M had not been moved to a higher level of care. He reached out to his social worker, desperate and afraid of the harm that he was going to cause himself. And the social worker elevated the request within CHS. CHS then responded that it was DOC's responsibility to move the client. But when we inquired with DOC, they shared that there was only one psychiatrist available on staff to complete the required evaluations for upwards of 60 people waiting to be transferred to specialized mental health units, and that there's only room for three to four people in the pens where the evaluations happen, causing a huge backlog. People experiencing mental health crises are just not safe in the jails. There is nothing unclear about that, and something must be done. Um, additionally, many of our incarcerated clients are victims of physical assault, which leave them with serious injuries that, if not treated properly, can be life altering. Uh, despite this, DOC routinely fails to produce our clients to specialist appointments, often for many months and sometimes up to a year. Many of our clients are facing lifelong medical consequences and long term disabilities, such as permanent nerve damage, mobility issues, eyesight loss, among other consequences due to DOC's negligent pattern of non production. Even with our advocacy, our clients continue to face months of waiting with no end in sight, and they will continue to suffer from this negligence long after their time in custody. These are permanent consequences. Um, we acknowledge and appreciate the board's most recent report surrounding suicides um, and drug-related overdoses in custody and the recommendations issued for CHS and DOC, but we agree with other advocates that shared today that the recommendations are not enough. Um, we urge the board to do tangible, concrete follow-up with both agencies, and we need a firm timeline for implementing urgently needed changes to the way our clients are receiving care in custody. Um, and that's going to require meaningful intervention on the part of the board. 
We also encourage the board to speak directly to as many people in custody as they possibly can, to be tracking the patterns that they see in the 311 reports and reaching out and talking to people directly about what they're sharing in those reports. We also strongly urge the board members to all be visiting the jails more frequently and to utilize defenders and other advocates as a resource to help guide your efforts. Um, just lastly, my last few seconds I just want to share about programming. Um, the Deputy Commissioner of Programs was not available today, but I do encourage the board to look more into what programming is actually being offered to clients in custody. We regularly hear from our clients that they are desperately seeking programming. They have nothing to occupy their time or their minds, um, and programming is critical for, for public safety. Our clients need something to be doing during the days, and there just is nothing available to them in the facilities right now. Um, so we just want to please ask the board to make sure that programming is available to our clients um, soon. Thank you so much. I'm not sure if you called me because I can't hear anything, um, but I did get unmuted, so I'm going to assume that it's my turn. Um, good uh, afternoon. I'm Kayla Simpson. I'm a staff attorney at the Legal Aid Society's Prisoners' Rights Project. Um, regret not being with you in person. Um, I just want to touch on two things. Um, first, I want to thank the board for the report about the 10 deaths in 2021. Um, uh, from self-harm and overdoses, that is, of Kayla? all the valuable take. Yes? Can you please give us one second so we can make sure that the board uh, is able to hear you? One second. Oh, with pleasure. Thank you for your patience. Uh, just a, it'll be a few moments more. No worries. And if that's Denise, feel free to interrupt me if there continues to be a problem.
I'm so I'm so sorry, Amanda. I, I can't hear you if you're telling me to do something or not telling me to do something. Kayla, you can go ahead and give your uh, your comments. We can hear you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, feel free to stop me. Stop me again if need be. Um, as I said, my name is Kayla Simpson. I'm a staff attorney from the Legal Aid Society's Prisoners' Rights Project. Um, and first, I just want to thank the board for the report about the 10 deaths in 2021 from self-harm and overdoses. Um, of all of the valuable takeaways from the report, I'd just like to note three. Takeaway one, um, I think this report shows how the board can continue to play a unique and truly indispensable role in this moment. You gave the public information that we did not get anywhere else, certainly not from DOC, who despite their claims of transparency did not reveal the items in this report about 2021 or about the first three deaths in 2022, or even give written responses to your recommendations. And even independent of your role, monitoring minimum standards, whatever their status, the city charter gives you the board the general duty to inspect and report and evaluate the performance of the department. And we can think of few areas more important than finding out why people are dying. Takeaway two, the events and findings in this report are appalling, but the fact that they are not new is more appalling still. I was struck by footnotes 37 through 44 in the recommendation section because all eight of them say that the recommendations were made previously in response to another preventable death. And if we want to know how we stop this, as Chair Medina says, we have to acknowledge how normalized these behaviors are. These staff aren't missing a round or two. Over and over again, they don't do them. And then they say that they did. And these staff reactions, and Dr. V is right, this is about more than absent staff. It's about how staff who show up do this job. In 2019, DOC staff watched Nicholas Feliciano hang for eight minutes. In 2020, a captain stopped, stopped staff from helping Ryan Wilson as he hanged for 14 minutes. And those staff letter. In 2021, this report describes myriad similar incidents, like an officer leaving Javier Velasco hanging in a cell for four minutes so they could go get other officers to record them performing CPR. In 2022, nine months into a new administration, the callous disregard for human life and fundamental correctional incompetence remain. And we need look no further back than just a few weeks ago as officers Kayla. showed no urgency. Yes. Uh, you were doing great. And uh, unfortunately, we are not hearing you. So it, okay. we can see you, but we can't hear you. So just a few moments. <laughs> Can you try speaking now, Kayla? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Oh, hallelujah. Uh, where did I lose you? What, what brilliant portion. 2022. In 2022. In 2022, thank you. Nine months into a new administration, the callous disregard for human life and fundamental correctional incompetence remains. And we need look no further back than just a few weeks ago as officers watched our client, Michael Nieves, bleed out on the floor. And I think we need to sit with this. For human beings to behave this way towards other human beings is brokenness. And those violence indicators that, thank you, thank you for referencing them, are, are not evidence of an agency trending in the right direction. And I think all of that leads us to takeaway three, which is that the board has an ongoing critical role to play because DOC continues to show, and it showed today, that it cannot police itself and it will not volunteer this information. And I think we need this board to put self-harm on your agenda every month and demand the answers that they did not give to the report and they did not give today every month for what progress they've made on these recommendations. And then issue notices of violation for the myriad standards violations underlying these deaths. And I wanna make one more point and thank you for your patience if you don't mind. 
Um, second, thanks so much for raising the lockdowns issue. And to add one point about that, regarding uh, our Agnew case in which the department is currently in contempt of a court order to provide access to medical care, we wanted to point out the connection uh, to data about missed medical appointments and lockdowns. We've talked about failures to provide escorts to clinics, of course, um, of which there were over 300 in just July, but that's not the only number that got worse. In July alone, there were over 1,300 missed medical appointments due to lockdowns and alarms. Those disrupt mandated services, and that causes sickness and harm. And that's just but one illustration of the hydra of dysfunction in this agency that requires a, a close look. Because of course, the suspension of a lockdown standard doesn't suspend the duty to provide access to medical care during that lockdown. So we encourage the board to continue to monitor lockdowns. Thank you so much for raising it and following up today. And alarms and data reported by DOC very closely. And then issue notices of violation where you see standards not being met and continue telling us what you find. Um, and we thank you very much and thank you for your patience. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is uh, Kelly Grace Price. Your name. Hi, I'm sorry. Good afternoon. Um, it's Kelly Grace Price from Close Rosies. I'll turn in my more comprehensive written testimony. I'd like to focus on just two things that I'd like the board to pay very careful attention to. The first is the lack of any showing about what's going on with the interagency task force. When that task force was approved and touted to the federal judge, there was all kinds of language in the transcript about the task force having transparency and giving updates to the BOC and the city council with regularity. None of that has happened. Please, please hold the DOC accountable. Don't let them send a puppet with a smooth voice to DOC without any answers again. The second thing I'd like to the BOC to really, really focus on is this issue of what happens when an emergency is going on in a unit over and over and over there. You, the BOC has asked the DOC to look into cutting down the escalation before a call is made to the medical unit for help. And that was in your report and CHS didn't really respond in their response response to your report. But that's something I believe that the, the BOC can really work on and and drill into. Even the people on the BOC that don't apparently seem to read these reports have heard that said over and over. And I believe that that's an issue that you can really work on and that will save lives. I'll present the rest of my written testimony, which also includes a deep dive into the paltry data presented in the DOC database. But I, I appreciate you always giving me the chance to come to these hearings and offer my opinions. And I'm very calmly and, and um, politely asking you to focus on this, this, uh, this business of the escalation causing delays in getting medical units in emergencies. Thank you very much, Kelly Grace Price from Close Rosies. Thank you. The next speaker is Lucas Marquez. Uh, Lucas, you uh, Lucas go ahead. Ahead. Hi, um, my name is Lucas Marquez. I'm Associate Director of Civil Rights and Law Reform at Brooklyn Defender Services. Um, we just wanted to talk a little bit about the lockdowns, um, the excessive lockdowns as we've heard today um, and how frequently they've been this summer. Um, DOC provided today that they're using the lockdowns as part of a quote violence reduction plan as described seemingly to be a pre preemptive initiative rather than in response to something actionable. Such preemptive action and their frequency of use must be weighed against the significant harm that these lockdowns are doing to the people in custody. The lockdowns are not temporary, as you know. Certain of these lockdowns have been extended for multiple days in a row. 
some around a week or more. During this time, there's no access to regular showers, commissary phones, or medical treatment. Uh, BDS and other advocates have raised these issues in real time with DOC and notified the board, um, but did not receive a response from DOC. Um, it is particularly troubling um, where these use of lockdown practice has increased over the course of the year, and there is not a correlation always between incidents of violence and the length of the lockdowns. Um, and just to talk a little bit more about what Kayla was mentioning about the access to medical care and the lockdowns, um, DOC continues to fail to ensure medical access in July. Um, from June to July, the number of scheduled medical appointments remain the same. But the number of missed appointments in July doubled do due to lockdown and increased from about 200 to 1,000 due to alarms. Um, you know, we, we just asked BOC to continue to monitor lockdown, um, you know, to work with the advocates, uh, you know, so that we can have more information about the people in custody where we're hearing about lockdowns and also to review and assess DOC's data. Um, and the last point I wanted to raise was regarding protective custody and safety transfers. We've been having a lot of issues getting people um, in custody evaluated for and into protective custody or safe units, even where an evaluation is ordered by the court and we raise it with DOC, and we raise it with DOC again. Um, it, it's been very difficult to ensure that people um, who ask for and want to be placed in protected custody are put into these units. Um, and this includes people who have suffered sexual and physical assaults. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Moira Marquis. Hello, um, can everyone hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, my name is Moira Marquis, and I'm reading this statement on behalf of Books Through Bars, uh, which is based in New York. And this follows up on the comments made by Jonathan Cortez earlier regarding the proposed Securus tablets at Rikers. Um, so Books Through Bars is an all-voluntary project that sends approximately 10,000 packages of books annually to incarcerated individuals in over 37 states and federal facilities, including New York City's jails. Um, Bookster Bars is testifying today in opposition of the Securus JPay tablets or any other for-profit organization providing tablets to New York City jails. We receive many letters which underscore the importance of having reading materials, whether they are novels, history, or comics. One letter we recently received ended by saying, books are the only thing that got me through. There's a very limited library. Tablets can serve a useful function if provided by a locally based not-for-profit organization that gives incarcerated people free access to reading materials. And we advocate to include active user content as input um, for what content is provided. And the Brooklyn Public Library has been providing this service through tablets that were recently confiscated at Rikers. Um, but the BOP is under uh, negotiations of a contract with Securus um, to replace those. And Bookster Bars objects to this service being transferred to a for-profit organization that is only seeking their, their enrichment. As COVID-19 and many other people who have been talking about the lockdowns demonstrate, the library access along with programming can be restricted or entirely eliminated from whole facilities for days, weeks, even years. And so maximum access to reading materials and information is part of keeping people sane and safe. And tablets should not be used as an excuse to limit the physical books or other reading materials, but they should definitively not be paid for by tax dollars or people who are incarcerated for the enrichment of a private corporation. We appreciate um, this opportunity to speak with you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker is now. Natalie Fiorenzo. Hi there. Can you all see and hear me okay? Yes. 
Yes. Okay. Please let me know if that does change. Um, I just like to start by saying that I'm not sure if you all are aware, but the public link has not been working um, this morning. So I do hope, especially because the Department of Corrections did leave before the public comment section that it is being recorded so that they could at least hear individuals in their custody speaking up um, as well as applicants. It is. Okay. Um, all right. Now I will begin my testimony. My name is Natalie Fiorenzo, and as a correction specialist at New York County Defender Services, I speak with our incarcerated clients every day. Um, and I can definitively tell you, despite the claims made this morning, Rikers Island remains a living hell. For my testimony today, I will share just a handful of the human rights violations that we've reported to DOC legal and exactly how effectively they have been addressed um, since the last meeting. On July 12th, GRVC Unit 5B was locked in for five days without access to regular meals, medical treatment, or phone calls. They could shower, but the showers were filled with sewage. On July 14th, Corrections officers in GRVC Unit 5A purposefully opened cell doors in order to allow detainee altercations. On July 18th, a client housed in West Facility was not permitted to drink clean water, shower, use the phone, or have access to commissary for four days. On July 19th, a client was held on Rikers for a week past his release date because the Department of Corrections staff did not realize that the charges holding him in were actually made void months prior. On July 20th, a client held at Rosie's was being threatened by corrections officers and other detainees. When she reported it to Priya, she was told that she would have to fight a fellow detainee if she wanted to be transferred to a different unit. On July 21st, one of our young adult clients housed in Building 12 of Rosie's, a mental health unit, was in her cell for 24 hours a day. Is there a problem? It's a little choppy. So I'm going to turn off my video. OK, I hope this helps. I'm going to continue now. Um, our client was in a mental health unit, locked in her cell for 24 hours a day, not permitted to shower, go to rec, or have access to programs or services. After multiple weeks in these conditions, she attempted suicide. On August 13th, officers and a captain opened a sealed door into dorm two east of Rosie's, allowing an unauthorized detainee in to attack another detainee. The detainee who was the victim of the attack was then immediately pepper sprayed by the same officers. On August 16th, a client in protective custody in AMKC was repeatedly called homophobic slurs by a corrections officer in his unit. After it was reported, the CO was moved to the other side of the unit, but continued to go out of his way back to our client's cell to harass him. On August 17th, a client housed in Five Upper at EMTC did not receive food for three days. DOC was not providing enough food for the whole unit, and if you were too sick or tired to physically fight for food, you would not get to eat. On August 18th, we received notice that detainees in GRVC Unit 9A were routinely sexually harassed by the search teams. The same search teams that the first deputy commissioner declared this morning are significantly reducing violence when, in fact, they are inappropriately touching our clients during their excessive searches. You're coming up on time. I'm sorry. If you could just, um, you can finish. OK, I'm not quite finished yet. On August 18th, a client in AMKC One Upper was sexually assaulted by a search team after a captain made an offensive comment to our client and the client did not react to it. The captain then ordered a search where our client was forced to undress and was touched inappropriately. These are just some of what we had reported in the last 60 days. If we do get a response about them, DOC Legal informs us that an investigation is underway and we are directed to the investigation division for updates. But I'm the sorry. investigation division, yes? I'm sorry, but could you wrap it up? You are you are past time, just in all fairness. OK, in all fairness, I think everyone was past time today. And I have been speaking more slowly due to the technical difficulties. You do have technical difficulties, so so go ahead and finish. But, in all, you know, I'm attempting to keep it fair. Um, we, we're trying not to let people go over time, but if you insist. I do insist. Thank you. Um, the investigation division refuses to talk to us and redirects us back to DOC legal, leaving us with no answers. And that's only when they do respond, because oftentimes they don't at all. 
Um, I implore the board to ensure a much higher sense of urgency and responsibility from the legal division and a streamlined, effective source of communication with the investigation division. We should not have to spend days figuring out what red tape to cut through when we're trying to remove our clients from a dorm where he will be stabbed in the next 12 hours. These incidences demonstrate the department ignoring its own policies and failing to address very real dangers to our clients. These are the same dangers that allowed for 16 deaths in 2021 and 13 this year so far. The okay. board needs to start publicly advocating for a federal receivership in the city's jails because people are dying and others are being traumatized for life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. And, and to the extent you have concerns and you want to raise them with us, I am always there and I often talk to people in, among the defenders and you can reach me in my office. The next speaker is Serena Townsend. Hello, can you see and hear me? Yes. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, my name is Serena Townsend. I'm a partner at criminal defense and civil litigation firm, Townsend, Matola, and Uris Law, and I'm a consultant with Campaign Zero. Formerly, as you know, I was the deputy commissioner of the Intelligence Investigation and Trials Division at the New York City Department of Correction. I wanna thank you for holding this hearing and for increasing oversight and investigation into DOC. Today, I will focus on metrics because four months ago at a hearing on May 24th, DOC told Judge Laura Swain that it could stave off federal receivership with its vague recycled action plan. The question was asked, how would you progress, how would progress and success be measured under this action plan in order to avoid federal receivership? The answer given by DOC was metrics. Judge Swain allowed DOC to determine what metrics would be measured by and to present its progress in November. DOC was literally allowed to write its own test and given six months to pass. When Judge Swain specifically asked DOC, is it your position that there are no legal, contractual, regulatory, or state law barriers to prevent you from coming into compliance? The answer given was yes, and that the metrics would prove it. So let's take a look at the metrics as they stand with six weeks left to go until the November hearing. Since that hearing in May, eight more people have died on Rikers Island, bringing the total to 13 this year alone. 14 if you count the correction officer who died days ago on the island while working his post. That's almost one death every two weeks since the action plan was implemented. Slashings and stabbings of detainees are up 40% from last year's horrific numbers. Mass absenteeism is still a problem. Use of force is up, according to the controller's dashboard. The department has not posted the PREA 540 report, which is now a month overdue, likely because for the first time in years, they've fallen out of compliance. Claims of data transparency and progress have been proven over and over to be false or misleading. Those are the metrics. A federal receivership is necessary. The argument for a receiver is that a receiver, by definition, circumvents archaic rules that currently prevent DOC from hiring talented, uniform leaders, swiftly disciplining officers, changing sick leave rules, and expediting procurement of things like doors that lock and technology to move DOC away from paper-based systems. I recommend anybody interested in learning more about receivership go to www.rikersisland.org. I just want to say real quick from the testimony today that I heard, there was an excuse for the lock-ins um, given that it was because investigations needed to occur into use of force. I will tell you um, that based on my experience in investigating thousands of use of force on Rikers Island, that's extremely suspect testimony. And secondly, the idea that investigators are patrolling facilities to prevent contraband from coming in via staff, uh, I would be shocked if that were true. And I encourage the board to ask the department for their reports from the investigation division, not from today and onward, but from before today on whether that's actually happening. I'm going to end with this. No problem. I'm wrapping it up. Yes, I held DOC staff accountable for over five years. But before that, I was a prosecutor for a decade. I worked with law enforcement to bring justice to literally thousands of crime victims. The public has heard me rally for detainee rights. Hear me when I also say this. Correction officers would also benefit from a federal receiver. They are working cruel hours. They need better leaders and better training. 
the officers who come to work while their colleagues play sick, the ones who do their jobs honestly while others bring in contraband and scam overtime, they are victims of this mismanagement and their corrupt union too. If the metrics show that DOC can't keep detainees or staff alive on Rikers Island, if DOC cannot pass its own metrics test, then receivership is the only safe option. Thank you so much for your time and good luck. The public comment period is concluded. Uh, the board next public meeting is scheduled for October 18th at 9 a.m. We will provide meeting details on our website and we will send an email to interested parties without hearing any objection. Meeting is now adjourned. Second. You know, Jack, we're going to have to put Torres on the carpet.